I have my volume turned down as well. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, so the exams uh, on this Wednesday, again, slightly smaller exams because it's just one uh, topic, one section, uh, but uh, still equally important. Then you have your spring break. Uh, apparently, uh, if we've learned anything this weekend, don't go to Florida. And uh, other than that, uh, when you come back, because I want to encourage you to be looking ahead at the respiratory system and the urinary system, you have two pre-labs, not reviews, but pre-labs do when you come back on Monday. All right, questions on any of that? Yeah, I had a question about the exam. Yes. Um, I don't know if anybody else experienced it, but with the lab, how it's set up, um, when I'm done, I like to go back and reread my answers. But for some reason in the lab, when you try to click that um, little box in the top right the corner top, yeah. that has the numbers, when I click it, it tells me I'm going to exit the exam. So it won't let me. Yeah. So uh, you may get my understanding of how it works. And again, I'm not able to replicate it as the instructor. But my understanding is what it says is that that you may be disconnected for doing that. But if you click on it, it shouldn't disconnect you. However, on the off chance that it does disconnect you, then as long as there's still room time remaining in the exam, you can immediately get back in. So it shouldn't be an issue that way. So uh, you would have to do the scan again and go through all that, you know, some of those processes again, if you had to enter it again. Uh, but uh, especially if you're just going back to the first one and then going to click through them in order, it shouldn't be an issue. So I know there is a warning because I know, uh, I know um, at least one or two uh, students have been kicked out from that doing that, but I also know that plenty of students have not as well. So hopefully it won't kick you out. I think uh, I'm not sure what the criteria is for it. It may have to do with how much RAM you have or something along those lines, but uh, you should be able to. And even if you do get kicked out of the exam, uh, you should be able to get back into it. So it looks like Izzy was kicked out a couple times, but was able to get back in as well. So, uh, so yes, I, again, I apologize for this format. I, this is not the way that I normally like doing my lab exams. The lab exams in the past have all been on the same page. But in, after the first exam in both your class and in the 431 class, I mean, in the 430 class, for whatever reason, this semester, it's not working properly. I don't know if it's because they've done a lot of updates to uh, Proctoria, a lot of updates to Canvas. I'm not sure what the problem is. Uh, but uh, and this is the way that seems to have fewer problems with it. So unfortunately, this is the format that we're using right now. So yeah, so hopefully we'll make the best of that. All right. Uh, the only reason you shouldn't be able to get back in is if your time is over. If the time is over, then that's the only reason that you shouldn't be able to get back in. So I don't know if you were tight on your time, uh, Marion, but, um, but if you were able to get in the last one, then, then that's the most important thing. And like I said, and for, I apologize for this. This, Like I said, this is not the ideal way to do this, but this is kind of what we're stuck being forced to have to do because of this situation, which hopefully will eventually end. All right, questions on anything else? All right, let's dive back into lecture. We left off last time and we were working our way through the alimentary canal and we got into the small intestine and we were talking about the accessory structures. We talked about the pancreas, uh, we talked about the anatomy of the gallbladder and of the liver, uh, but what we were left with is the functions of the liver. Come on, there we go. And again, we could spend the rest of this class time and half of the next talking about all the things that the liver does. The liver is truly a huge workhorse organ in the body. It is the largest visceral organ uh, in the body. And uh, again, uh, so we're gonna generalize things a little bit, but in general, we're going to divide the over 200 liver functions into basically three somewhat overlapping uh, general categories. And those are metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, and again, those are the two that are kind of related to each other, and also bile production. 
Let's talk about metabolic regulations first. Again, the liver's job is to help to regulate the composition of the, of the blood, to help to make uh, the blood uh, the, um, the resource necessary for the tissues of the body to get what they need to do. To, right, so all of the tissues of the body are reliant on our uh, on our cardiovascular system to provide them with oxygen, provide them with nutrients, and things along those lines. So, our liver's major job is to again make it nutrient appropriate. Right, make sure that it has the appropriate amount of um, glucose, the appropriate amount of you know um, amino acids, and all sorts of other components with that as well, as well as removing toxins uh, from the food that we get from our digestive system. And as we know, that hepatic portal system takes all the blood from the digestive system and brings it to the liver first where it will store excess nutrients. And if, there, if the uh, diet that you ingested is deficient in some resources, then it can replace those resources as well. And again, like we talked about, this includes maintaining glucose levels, maintaining lipid and amino acid levels, uh, getting rid of toxins uh, like any kind of uh, drugs, both uh, medicinal and recreational, uh, toxins from the foods that we ingest. Uh, it inactivates nitrogen wastes, <coughs> excuse me, that are produced by many of our biological processes that have taken place or may be ingested in our food. And not only does our liver play an important role in producing some hormones, activating some hormones, like we'll talk about uh, angiotensin uh, gets converted into angiotensin II in the liver and things along those lines, but it also plays a role in helping to uh, regulate other organ systems with those hormones that it either activates or it produces. So it is about sending signals in the blood. It is about making nutrients appropriate in the blood so that it can be sent to the parts of the body so that the parts of the body can get the things that they need. Now, related to this, obviously, because it still relates to the blood, remember also that the liver then has a very large blood supply. So it is a blood reservoir. <laughs> And as such, it's going to play an important role in regulating the composition of the blood itself. Right. So one of the ways it does this is by helping in our immune response. Uh, remember, we talked about those Kufr cells that line the inner surface of those sinusoid capillaries. They are phagocytes that are capable of any harmful pathogens that come in through our digestive tract uh, can be broken down and then can present those antigens on the surface. So as we know, an antigen presenting cell like a phagocyte, like the Kufr, what type of cells would it activate? My microphone is on, right? A phagolytic antigen presenting cell would activate what type of cells? Come on, we're only like 15 minutes in. You guys can't all be asleep already. Excellent. What type of T cells? T cells come in basically two flavors CD8 and CD4. So exactly, helper T cells, exactly. So the CD4, remember antigen presenting cells like phagocytes like the Kufr cells uh, express the uh, major histocompatibility complex class two proteins, which activate the CD4 helper T cells. And the fact that this is a cumulative class has me a little worried about you guys. Uh, our, uh, as we'll talk about a lot when we get to the urinary system, it is very important to maintain the osmolarity of our blood as well, having the amount or right amount of stuff in it. And so many of the stuff are plasma proteins and many of them like albumin uh, are produced by or, or regulated by the liver. So that's gonna be an important function. 
and uh, it is going to basically be able to um, help to also modify our immune response by uh, breaking down antibodies, breaking down hormones that have been made by the body, breaking down toxins that have either been ingested or made by the body, uh, like uh, lactic acid we talked about way back in the muscular system. Right. Once you make that hormone, that adrenaline, and release it into your blood, you don't want it in your blood forever. So it's going to break down uh, that, uh, that adrenaline over time. Same thing with antibodies, same things with things like lactic acid that the body is producing. And same thing with drugs, right? As we talked about before, how you ingest a drug, how efficient that drug is going to be, is gonna be mainly dependent on how efficient the liver is breaking it down. If a medication is very effectively broken down by the liver, is that a medicine you necessarily want to take as a pill that you swallow? No, exactly. Because then remember, if we swallow it, it goes into the blood vessels of the digestive system, goes straight to the liver, and the majority of it would be broken down before it ever got distributed throughout the body. So if a, horm if a, if a, if a medicine is uh, broken down significantly, efficiently by the liver, then you need to take it intermuscularly, or you need to take it you know, interperitoneally, or you need to take it into a blood vessel or something along those lines to mediate the spread of it that way. So it affects the mode of transmission, how efficient it is, things along those lines as well. All right, the last function of the kidney, uh, pardon me, the liver involves bile production. Again, depending on your diet, how much you eat, the type of, the type of foods you eat, uh, the volume of food you eat, it varies from person to person. But on average, our hepatocytes in their spare time, you know, as their hobby, uh, they produce about a liter of bile during the course of the day. Remember, that doesn't mean that you release a liter of bile into your alimentary canal because some of that, a lot of that can be stored and concentrated in our gallbladder. Remember, that's the key to our gallbladder. Not only stores it, but it withdraws water from it, concentrating that bile. And in fact, the bile in your gallbladder can be as much as 10 times as concentrated as the bile uh, when it is first produced. What hormone did we say regulated bile production? Was it the cholecystokinin? Exactly, cholecystokinin, absolutely. That is our primary hormone, again, triggered by the stimulus of lipids being present in the small intestine. Uh, we get the, those enteroendocrine cells produce the cholecystokinin. Excellent, and that causes both the liver to increase bile production, uh, but also for it to uh, cause the uh, hepatopancreatic sphincter to open, the gallbladder to contract, all those things so that we can be releasing that bile into our duodenum. Bile uh, consists of water, cholesterols, uh, ions, uh, bilirubin, which is an important pigment. Anybody know where the bilirubin pigment comes from? Breakdown of red blood cells. Exactly. Basically what happens is that the hemoglobin, uh, when those red blood cells are broken down is converted into, a part of that uh, process is converting into bilirubin as it is broken down. And when the bilirubin is released into the alimentary canal and is part of the breakdown process of our lipids, that bilirubin gets broken down into urobilin, which is actually a, uh, a yellowish pigmentation that is actually reabsorbed by the body. And when it's reabsorbed in the alimentary canal, it is actually released in the urine, giving our urine its yellow coloration. 
Bilirubin is also broken down, so it's broken down into both urobilin and stericobilin. And that stericobilin is a brownish pigmentation that stays in the alimentary canal and colors our feces. So, you know, one of the things that people have been studying for a very long time is the coloration of the urine, the coloration of our feces, because it can give you some indication of the overall health of an individual, uh, but it is directly related to the breakdown of red blood cells in our body. Right. If you are breaking down too many red blood cells or if your liver is not as efficient at processing that bilirubin, it ends up backing up in the system. And what do we call that condition where you start to get massive amounts of bilirubin in the blood? Jaundice. Yeah, jaundice, where you start getting a yellow coloration to the skin, uh, especially the mucosa of the eyes, the lips, areas of that. Start, you get an orangish yellowish coloration as a result of that. Absolutely. Bile has a yellow greenish color and it's relatively alkaline. Uh, makes sense. Again, we want to break down those uh, that acidic chyme and those fatty acids of the lipids. We just talked about how it breaks down into uh, form stercobilin and urobilin. We did that already. Oops. And the important thing to remember is what bile does. Do I have that on the next slide? Yeah, there we go. What bile does is that it emulsifies dietary fats. What does that mean? What's the implication of that? Breaks it down. True, but as you remember, we've talked about there are two ways we can break things down. Mechanical breakdown? Mechanically and chemically, absolutely. And in this case, emulsifying of fats is a mechanical uh, breakdown. Basically, fats are hydrophobic. So what ends up happening is you get this big, huge glob of fat, right? Again, you've all experienced this for yourself. Yes, because you've eaten fats, but even more than that, right? The weekend just ended. So one of the things you like to do on the weekend is, you know, spend the eight hours making your, your sauce uh, so that you can make a nice big lasagna. And after you make that lasagna, you need to soak the dish. And when you put the water in the dish, there's a big, huge pool a fat that forms on the surface because of all those li hydrophobic lipids all come together and form a big, huge pool of fat in the middle of that pan. And then you take a tiny drip of dish soap, add it to that drip, and what happens to that big, huge ball of fat in the center of your pan? Breaks apart. Yeah, it completely disappears. And the reason it disappears is what it means to emulsify is basically to take this big chunk of fat and break it up into little tiny pieces. And notice when you break this up into little tiny pieces, it tremendously increases the surface area, right? So it has a massive now surface to volume ratio, and that makes it much easier for your lipids to be able to be broken down by the enzymes. So this is a mechanical breakdown, taking a big thing, breaking it down to little things. You should have seen this in your Physio X where you were looking at the lipids. Uh, bile does not change the pH. It does not form fatty acids, right? It just breaks big triglycerides into little triglycerides. And that, but that allows the enzymes to get in there and break those triglycerides up into alcohols and fatty acids. All right, so again, that emulsification is a mechanical breakdown. The same way that hydrochloric acid, remember, was a mechanical breakdown of proteins. So this is a way that we open it up, make it easier for the enzymes to do their job. Now, about 90% of our bile salts are actually reabsorbed and recycled. And this reabsorption primarily occurs in the ileum. We've got this great illustration that does, uh, that shows a nice thing, that shows this uh, process really, really nicely. Uh, what's cool is, again, if you think about it, when it gets absorbed by the small intestine, of course, as we know, it goes into the blood. And one of the places that it's going to go is straight back to the liver. And one of the things that happens is when the liver starts to see that bile coming back to it in the hepatic portal vein, 
Well, it knows that there are lipids in the digestive system, and so it is going to actually increase its bile production using those bile salts. In fact, it's possible for a single bile salt to be used as many as a half dozen times in the digestion of a food. So these salts can constantly be recirculated as their uh, presence re enhances the production of bile. Here's the pretty picture that shows this process. So notice it starts here with our chyme entering into uh, the small intestine. As we know, when that occurs, that causes the enteroendocrine cells to produce cholecystokinin. And that cholecystokinin is going to enter into the blood supply where it is going to go to the liver. Once the cholecystokinin gets into the liver, it stimulates the liver to make bile. So our liver makes bile. It stimulates our gallbladder to release bile. It opens up the valve so that bile is released into the small intestine where we start the mechanical breakdown of our lipids. That allows the lipids to be chemically broken down breaking them down into their small bit-sized pieces, allowing them to be reabsorbed in the small intestine. And when they're absorbed in the small intestine, once again, those bile salts are going to go back to the liver. And as they go back to the liver, they stimulate more bile production. Notice this is an example of a positive feedback process. The more lipids that are present in the small intestine, the more bile we're going to produce, meaning the more bile we're going to absorb, meaning the more bile that is going to stimulate the liver to produce even more bile. And this process continues as long as there are lipids inside of the small intestine to be able to be broken down and absorbed. And so, like I said, in this process, uh, a single bile salt can be used as many as a half dozen times as it is constantly being recycled and reabsorbed. All righty. Now, that brings us to our next big concept, absorption. We've talked about ways that we can chemically and mechanically break down foods and our job is to take those big, huge, complex macromolecules and break them down into their basic components. And let's remind ourselves of what those basic components are. Let's see, our four complex macromolecules are lipids, our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our nucleic acids. What are the building blocks? What are the basic components of lipids again? I think I just said it literally like five minutes ago, but someone remind me. Triglycerides. Well, triglycerides are the big, huge macromolecules. What do they get broken down into? What are the building blocks? What are the basic components of a triglyceride? Alcohol. alcohols like glycerol, and there's the tri part of it. What does the tri refer to? What is there three of? Fatty acids. Fatty acids, exactly. So those are the building blocks of our lipids. What are the building blocks of carbohydrates? Monosaccharides. There you go. Something like that. Uh, amino, uh, what is the uh, building blocks of proteins? Amino acids. Acids. And what are the building blocks of our nucleic acids? Sugar and nitrogenous bases. Absolutely, exactly. And in fact, uh, that sugar, that nitrogen base, and that phosphate together form that nucleotide. So absolutely, it's a nucleotide, which you are absolutely correct. It's made up of nitrogen bases, made up of phosphates, and made up of sugars. Excellent. 
So our goal is to take these big complex macromolecules and break them down chemically. And of course we do that by enzymes and we've listed the enzymes. And again, they're in your lab manual and textbook, know what the common enzymes are and where they're produced. But remember, we also talked about how there are these brush border enzymes in the small intestine, right? The absorptive cells with their microvilli in the small intestine are lined not just with those cells that have the microvilli on them to increase their surface area, uh, but they also have a large number of um, enzymes on their surface as well that help to complete the final breakdown of our macromolecules. And remember, as we also talked about, play an important role in the activation of many of those enzymes that are produced in an inactive form. And we just did what they're broken down into, uh, so we don't have to do that again. And then of course, the majority of these components, once they're broken down, about 90% of them are absorbed in the small intestine, more towards the proximal end and less towards the distal end. Now, we left off last class looking at a simple version like this showing the absorptive pathways of some of these things. And as I mentioned at the end of the last class, we are going to go in depth on these three pathways right here. And I guaranteed you that one of them was going to be an essay question on this next exam. So let's talk about that. We are gonna talk about how things are chemically broken down, mechanically broken down, but remember we also have to talk about the absorption part. Absorption, if you think about it, if you're leaving the lumen of our alimentary canal, there are actually two membranes that you have to pass through. Because if you think about it, this is lined by those simple columnar cells with microvilli. And as we know, like many epithelial tissues and not surprisingly here in, this, in the small intestine or digestive system, these simple columnar cells are held together by those tight occluding junction, junctions. And if you remember those tight occluding junctions do two things. They make this layer more waterproof so things can't easily sneak between the layers of the cells. But we also know that the plasma membrane is a fluid mosaic and things can move around. The other advantage of these tight junctions is that they separate the apical surface from the basal surface. This is important because as it says here on the board, if some nutrient is going to get absorbed into our body, it actually has to pass through two membranes. It has to pass through the apical membrane, and wow, that is a large arrow. It has to pass through the apical membrane, and then it has to pass through the basal membrane. From there, it is going to be in the interstitial fluid. And then, of course, once it's in the interstitial fluid, it's going to get picked up and carried somewhere in our body. There are two membranes it has to pass through. And the mechanisms are going to be different. Different channels and transporters on both the apical and basal surface. And so it is those tight junctions that also play an important role in helping to maintain that one way flow. So when we talk about absorption, once we break that macromolecule down into its basic components, we need to talk about how it gets across the apical surface and how it gets across the basal surface. Now, of course, as I'm sure you remember from 430, there are two primary types of membrane transports or all of the membrane transports can be broken down into two main categories. What are the two main categories? Facilitated. 
Okay. Uh, although most transport is facilitated. There you go. You've got the right idea. Active and passive. And of course, what again is the difference between those two? Using ATP or not? Exactly. Which one uses ATP? Active. Active, absolutely. Remember, either directly or indirectly. Uses ATP. Remember, primary active transport directly uses ATP. Uh, secondary active transport indirectly uses ATP. Passive does not use ATP. All right. And again, remember, yeah, someone mentioned facilitated. What does it mean? What does facilitated actually mean? It means something, um, something, well, facilitated it, carried it in <laughs> or go. helped it get in. It, it didn't just diffuse in on its own volition. It needed something else to get in. Absolutely. And that something else is typically a carrier or a channel. It's a protein. Absolutely. You guys are absolutely correct. Facilitated means that it needs the help of a protein. Some type of protein is involved in that process, right? Notice passive can be facilitated or, as someone mentioned out, simple diffusion. Right? If it's simple diffusion, uh, which again, and we can throw osmosis into that as well. Right, it's just passing through the plasma membrane without any problem at all. There is no protein involved. Obviously with active transport, because it uses ATP, uses those carriers, uses those pumps, uses those, those co-transporters, all of our active is facilitated. Right, there's no such thing as simple active transport. So all of them use some type of protein to be able to get in. But like we said, those can be directly using things like pumps, or it can be things that indirectly use ATP like our co-transporters. And if you don't remember any of these terms, I strongly encourage you to go back to chapter three when they talk about the cells and they talk about the plasma membrane to make sure you understand the differences between these if you do not remember them. So if you don't remember these types of things, go back to chapter three and look at them. And not surprisingly in our small intestine because we want to control the stuff that is being absorbed, it's primarily gonna either be co-transporters or some types of facilitated diffusion. But again, we will talk specifics in just a moment. Of course, once they get into the interstitial fluid, uh, that material is going to go into one of two places. Where are the one or two places that it's going to go? Capillaries. Absolutely. And what kind of capillaries? Lymph or blood vessel. There you go. It's either going to go into a lymph capillary. And of course, in the villi of the small intestine, we have a special name for the lymph capillaries. What was the special type of lymph capillary that is found in the small intestine? lacteals, excellent, or it's going to go into a blood vessel capillary. Excellent. And here's the good news. We have already studied the lymphatic system. We have already studied the blood circulation. So in both of these cases, whether it is in the lymphatic capillary or whether it is in a blood vessel capillary, we can actually trace the nutrient to the right atrium of the heart. So in both these cases, we will be able to trace the nutrient. Oops, why am I doing that there? Yeah, that's better. Excellent. So whether it goes into the lymphatic capillary or whether it goes into the blood vessel capillary, we will be able to trace its pathway. And that will also be a part of the essay question. Excellent. So let's do this. Again, here we have the simple illustration for it, but let's get into more specifics. And for this, I think it works best if we do this together on the whiteboard. So let's start here on the whiteboard. And again, 
One of the things that I'm going to emphasize to you is this is not the way that you are required to do it on the exam. Again, format isn't as important to me as making sure that all the information is there. But what I find convenient for me is when I organize this stuff. So for starters, let's organize this, and I think I need to use a smaller font. So first, we will talk about which macro molecule we are going to focus on, right? Excellent, so we're gonna talk about a specific macro molecule. Uh, and then we wanna know what it is broken down into, right? What the building blocks of it that are going to be absorbed are going to be. And when we do that, we wanna talk about how it's broken down. Both it's mechanical digestion and for that, we want to know the process and where it occurs. Give myself a little bit more room to play with here. Um, and also the chemical digestion. Again, in this case, because it's chemical, we want to know the name of the enzyme, where it's produced, and where it is used. Excellent. Then we want to think in terms of We want to know how it crosses the apical membrane. We want to know how it crosses uh, the basal membrane. And of course, what occurs in between. That sheet makes it a little shorter. And then the last thing we need to know is how it gets from the interstitial fluid to the right atrium. So there you go. That's all we need to know. Easy breezy lemon squeezing. So now we have a game plan. And again, this is not how you have to set it up, but as you'll see, this is a convenient way, at least for me to do it because it allows us to see the similarities and differences in these processes. All right, let's start easy first. Carbohydrates. What did we say carbohydrates are broken down into? Monosaccharides. Monosaccharides. Saccharides, excellent. So where are all the locations that mechanical digestion of monosaccharides takes place? What are the mechanical digestion processes and where do they occur? Give me one. Mastication. And where does that occur? Well. Mouth, excellent. Excellent, give me another one. Stomach. What happens in the stomach? Uh, churning of the stomach. Excellent. Let's 
stomach. Any others? Segmentation. Where does that occur? Small intestine. Excellent. Now notice we've done these three for carbohydrates, but really aren't all three of these used for all of our macromolecules? This is the part where we say yes emphatically. Yes, emphatically. Excellent. So notice if you think about it, we really don't have to specify which one it is. We know these three are going to be used for all of them anyway. So let's just go ahead and put them there here in bold. Because we know that they're going to be used for all of them. So for all of them, these are going to be definitely the ways we break things down mechanically. For carbohydrates, are there any additional ones? Are there any additional ways that we break it down? Mechanically, Mechanically no. no. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So we're done there. But it's an interesting question. And we'll see why that got asked later. So, excellent. So there are no additional ones. So let's go ahead and put a line through that for now. And let's focus on chemical digestion. What enzyme, where is that enzyme produced, and where is it used? Amylase and the salivary glands of the mouth. So more specifically, salivary amylase. Excellent. Uh, produced in the salivary glands and used in the mouth. Excellent. Any others? Pepsin for protein in the stomach. Yeah, but we're not doing proteins, we're doing carbohydrates. Pancreatic amylases. There you go. Pancreatic amylases. Where is it produced? Pancreas. Pancreas. Where is it used? Small intestine. There you go. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And we can't forget those brush border enzymes. Of the small intestine as well. Again, I told you, you don't have to know the names of them, but collectively, uh, you need to know that they are there and that they play an important role in finishing those processes. So again, after all of this mechanical breakdown, all of this chemical breakdown, up here, we are now left with our simple sugars, our monosaccharides, and they need to get across this apical uh, membrane. Now, as I'm sure you are aware, uh, we have a very, very uh, carbohydrate rich diet in a typical individual. So not surprisingly, uh, there's a lot of it in the food we ingest. So typically we can rely on that concentration gradient. So we can have a facilitated diffusion as one of the primary ways that we're going to get that in. And of course, remember that is passive. But how important is it to get glucose into our body, those simple sugars into our body so that we can use them? Super. Yeah, pretty darn important. So we don't want to rely just on passive processes. So we are also going to take advantage of co-transporters. So again, primarily, and I guess I should put that at the front of this as well. Primarily, our monosaccharides are going to uh, cross the apical surface uh, with both facilitated diffusion, which is passive, and co-transporters, which are active. Excellent. Now, once we get those monosaccharides into the uh, cell, 
it's no longer going to be lost. All right, because if you think about it, anything that stays out here in the lumen, doesn't cross that membrane, ends up in our feces, ends up lost from our body, right? Once it gets into the cell, technically it's not lost yet. Uh, it's not lost anymore, we're not gonna lose it. So our goal is to get it out that basal surface into the interstitial fluid. Since we're not going to be losing it anymore, is there as much of a need or a concern to use energy to be able to get it out of the cell? And as we move more and more of it in here, we are going to get an increase in the concentration of monosaccharides inside the cell versus outside the cell. So again, do you think we're gonna to need to require the use of any type of energy to be able to get those monosaccharides out of the basal surface? Is it as important to get them out or anything like that? No. So primarily we are gonna focus on uh, just use facilitated, oops, don't need that to capitalize anymore. And too big. primarily facilitated diffusion to get it out of the basal surface. Oops, that should be blue. Into the interstitial fluid. And of course, once it's in the interstitial fluid, which of our two types of vessels does it go into? A lymphatic capillary or a blood capillary? Blood. Excellent. And luckily we know our blood vessels. So our path to the heart, that capillary feeds into what? A vein. Which vein? Vena cava. Uh, eventually, it'll feed into uh, the uh, inferior vena cava. Eventually, it'll feed into the hepatic portal triad or part of the triad. But what is the first? So think back to cardiovascular system. Blood exits the uh, small intestine into a capillary, and that feeds into what vein? A venule. What? True. A uh, venule, which feeds into what vein? Intestinal vein. Excellent, into the intestinal vein. Now, as we said, this mostly happens in the proximal portion of the small intestine. So that intestinal vein is gonna feed into what blood vessel? The portal vein. Before the hepatic portal vein, you're right. It is going to feed into the hepatic portal vein, but what blood vessel feeds from the intestinal vein into the hepatic portal vein? Intestinal vein. Uh, there, but the intent, what is the intest? There's something in between the two. Think of the arteries. How do we get to, how did we get to the small intestine? Someone tell me how we got to the small intestine from the heart. Went down the aorta to the abdominal aorta, and we went into the, what is it? Common? Nope. Deliac? Nope. We want to get to the small intestine. Nope. Not these, I guess. There we go. Which one? Getting closer now. Which mesenteric goes to the small intestine? Try again. Well, if it's not the inferior, what must it be? You should be getting easier now. Superior. There you go. Superior mesenteric. Vein, which as you guys correctly pointed out, feeds into the hepatic portal 
vein, which feeds into what? Well, to get to the central vein, what does it have to pass through? Sinusoid. There you go. Sinusoid capillary, which then feeds it into the central vein, which then feeds it into what? Hepatic vein. Hepatic vein, which feeds into? Superior vena cava. Which feeds into? The right atrium. There you go. And there you go. Just that simply using all the information you should already know from this class, we were able to follow the path of that uh, simple sugar, that monosaccharide all the way to the heart where it can now be distributed throughout the body. And just that simply, we have done our carbohydrates. Notice I've done an amazing job of drawing this on the board, but you will also see that your book's got some pretty nice illustrations that do a good job of talking about this stuff as well. We talked about where it breaks it down both chemically and mechanically, and we did all of those. And here we see this nice flow chart from your textbook uh, showing this as well. In the oral cavity, our salivary amylase starts the breakdown process, right? Uh, when we get to the small intestine, our pancreatic amylase continues that breakdown. And then those brush border br uh, uh, enzymes break it down into its monosaccharides, right? Into the, uh, into the glucose and the you know, uh, all of those types of things, galactose and all of those types of simple monosaccharides. This happens to be where lactase is located. But again, I said you don't need to know the names of any of our uh, brush border enzymes, but it's one that many people, especially those who are intolerant to uh, milk, uh, are familiar with. Those monosaccharides then pass the apical surface using facilitated diffusion and co-transporters. So both passive and active transport into the cell. Again, we wanna use, we, we have a very uh, carbohydrate rich diet, so we can rely on that concentration gradient to get some in, but it's also very important that we get it. So we wanna make sure we're using some energy uh, to be able to make sure that we get the carbohydrates we need. And so we have those active co-transporters that help. But once it's in the side of the cell, we don't modify it in any way or form or shape, but we accumulate it inside. And that accumulation is going to lead to a concentration gradient, which will allow for the facilitated diffusion out into a capillary and then we followed its path back. All right. And that has how that game is played. Questions on that? Done in silence. Excellent. We love to see. All right. Well, then, if that makes sense, oops, let's close that. Then re let's reset the board and do it again with something else. I guess we can leave the arrows here. Since that, you know, that's the way they're going to go. Doot, 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 and doot. And doot. All right. Round two.
Proteins. What are proteins broken down into? Amino acids and small peptides. I mean, yeah, primarily amino acids. You're right. There's maybe some small minor polypeptides, but mostly amino acids is what we want. Excellent. When it comes to mechanical digestion, we, of course, have the big three, mastication, churning, and segmentation. But let's ask the question again. Are there for proteins any additional ways that proteins are mechanically digested? I did ask this question out loud, right? What is another way? Well, clearly, if I'm pausing this long, there must be another way. Ah, and there you go, Rose got it on the head. Our hydrochloric acid, absolutely, in the stomach. And remind me again, what produces that hydrochloric acid? It's the um, parietal cells. Parietal cells. And what is it that that hydrochloric acid actually does to proteins? Denaturing them. Excellent. That denaturing or denaturation of the proteins, that breaking of the hydrogen bonds, uncoiling, changing the shape of the proteins, making it easier for the enzymes to get in there and go snip, snip. Absolutely. So with proteins, we have an additional method of mechanical digestion that we did not see in our uh, carbohydrates that takes place in the stomach. Excellent. So what about chemical digestion? Where does chemical digestion begin for our proteins? Stomach. By what? Epsom. Excellent, pepsin. And what produces the pepsin? The chief cells. There you go. So the chief cells in the stomach and that gastric gland produces pepsin in the stomach, starting the chemical breakdown of our proteins there. What else? Any other enzymes? No, I'll give, you, I'll give you the one. We know there's brush porter enzymes. What? Pancreatic enzymes. Excellent. What are the pink? So absolutely. There are indeed some pancreatic enzymes uh, produced by the pancreas. And of course, used in the small intestine. And if you can even give me just the primary one, I'd be happy with that at this point. Trypsin. There you go. Trypsin. Peptidase. Yeah, carboxypeptidase, trypsin, uh, chymopexidase, uh, all of those were examples. But trypsin was the primary one. I'll, I'll settle for that in the pancreas, small intestine, and of course the brush border enzymes of the small intestine. Excellent. And those are what break our large proteins into amino acids. Now, how important is it to get these amino acids into our body? Super. Absolutely. Remember, as we talked about, your, your body is only 40% stuff, 60% water. And half of that stuff 20% of your body weight is proteins. 
It is vitally, vitally, vitally important. So this is not something we want to leave to chance. So we are going to use both primary and secondary active transport to get these amino acids out of the lumen and safe into our absorptive cells. I'm going to use all sorts of ATP, both primary and secondary active transport, co-transporters, pumps, all of those things to get the amino acids in. Because again, once those amino acids are in, they are saved. And if they're now saved and we're using a massive amount of energy to get them into the cell, that means we're gonna probably have a fairly large amount here inside the cell, high levels of amino acids inside. And so we don't necessarily have to waste any energy to get them out of the cell. So once again, we will rely on just simple facilitated oops, diffusion and some co-transporters, but mostly facilitated diffusion to get it out of the basal surface into the interstitial fluid. Of course, once it gets into the interstitial fluid, where is it gonna go? Blood capillaries. Excellent. Which, and those blood fat capillaries feed into? The intestinal vein. Which feeds into? Superior mesenteric vein. Which feeds into? Hepatic portal vein. Which feeds into sinusoid capillary, which feeds into the central vein, which feeds into hepatic vein, inferior vena cava, and right atrium. There you go. That all sounds vaguely familiar. Why is that? Deja vu. Yeah, because it's the exact same thing as the car, which means it should have been a lot easier for people to answer other than Laura. Laura, thank you for taking the wheel on that, but everybody should have known that because we literally just did it. And we've done it here on the board. Got your pretty pictures from your textbook. Oh, again, for small intestine, there are these nice charts. Well, if we were doing this, you have to know the third's going to be different. Right, if, if they were all three the same, I wouldn't bother asking the question. Uh, so here are the enzymes again for the small intestine. All right, we did proteins, we did all of that. Again, notice it starts in the stomach, it continues in the small intestine. The brush border enzymes lead to that uh, co-transport, both active and co-transport. I know your textbook shows facilitated diffusion here. And there can be a little bit, remember we're saying mostly, but the key to remember about amino acids is it is so vitally important to get those amino acids into our body. We are gonna use a massive amount of energy to get those in. It then leaves via facilitated diffusion. And again, as we mentioned, there will be some co-transport there as well. But again, it is very important to use the energy on the apical surface because if we don't bring it across that apical surface, we lose it. It is less important to use it out of the basal surface because once it's in the cell, we're not gonna lose it to the feces. Into the blood and we know what happens there. And because apparently your textbook thinks proteins, importance, and carbohydrates aren't, they've given us not only this chart that shows us the enzymes that are breaking them down, but it's also shown us this pretty picture that shows this process of them being broken down, crossing here with a co-transporter, leaving out of that facilitated diffusion and into the capillary.
why they did it for proteins and didn't do it for carbohydrates, I don't know. The editor must be on the paleo diet or something. All right. There is a picture like this for carbohydrates. Oh, ah, then there you go. They've added in the new version of the textbook. This is the, from the old version. I didn't look back at it. Okay, cool. excellent. See, there you go. Equality for all. Uh, we are uh, improving as a people. Excellent. So round two in the books. Let's do round three. Lipids. What do lipids get broken down into again? Triglycerides. Well, again, triglycerides are the most common type of lipid. So yes, when we're talking about our lipids, primarily we're talking about triglycerides. They get broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, it gets broken down to alcohols like, glyc uh, like glycerol Oops. and fatty acids. Excellent. We have the big three, mastication in the mouth, churning in the stomach, segmentation in the small intestine. And again, just because they're the same in all three, don't forget to put them in all three. And I'll ask the question again, are there any additional ways that our lipids are mechanically broken down? Bile salts break them into smaller parts. Excellent. And what did we call that process? Emulsification. Emulsification via the bile salts. Of course, what produces the bile salts? Excellent. Produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and used in the, where's it used? Small intestine? Yeah, small intestine, exactly. Excellent. Perfect. Chemical digestion. What's the first enzyme that helps in the chemical digestion of our fats? Bile salts. Well, no, remember, bile salts, remember, are involved in the mechanical digestion, not the chemical digestion. Pancreatic lipase. You are correct in that pancreatic, thanks to those bile salts, the pancreatic lipase is highly effective. Again, produced by the pancreas, uh, used in the small intestine. Oops. Excellent. But as Allison pointed out, we skipped one. Don't forget there is that lingual lipase that was produced by the tongue. However, even though it's produced by the tongue, where did it become active? Where does it actually start the breakdown process? In the mouth. Is it, act is it active in the mouth? In the stomach. In the stomach, excellent. Because of the change in pH. But you guys have hit on a huge point. There's no emulsification of those fats that are taking place inside of the stomach. So while technically it begins in the stomach, it really doesn't begin in earnest until we get to the small intestine when our bile salts can emulsify that fats and allow those enzymes to be much, much more effective. And of course, we'll still have some brush border enzymes that will help in this process as well. Okay, we're past our time for our break and I need my coffee, but let's finish this one off. At this point, lack of sleep, 
my uh, wife and dog woke me up early this morning. Um, so we have our alcohols, we have our fatty acids. and our bile salts. And what turns out what happens here is these things all mixed and mashed together. And when these alcohols and these fatty acids and these bile salts, which remember we know we need to reabsorb, mashed to, mash together, the bile salts coat the outer surface of our lipids and our alcohols, and they form a structure that is called a micelle. These micelles are small lipid soluble materials. Being lipid soluble, how do you think they cross the plasma membrane? Diffusion. they are gonna be able to cross that plasma membrane just by simple diffusion. Right. No need for the use of energy to get this across. Now, something else interesting happens once it gets absorbed. As we've mentioned, our bile salts, no. they separate, they leave the basal surface, they enter into the blood capillary and they go back to the liver. On the other hand, all those alcohols, and I'm just gonna abbreviate fatty acids, reform into triglycerides. And these triglycerides bind to other lipids like cholesterols, uh, like uh, phospholipids, like all of those types of things, to form a big, huge mass of fat. Now, if we have this big, huge mass of fat, that's not going to be something that's going to be easy to transport throughout the body. So then we have to coat the outer surface with proteins, or more specifically, with water soluble. And when we do all of this, we form a structure that is known as a chylomicron. Now, these chylomicrons are these big, huge, massive bundles of fat coated with proteins. So the good news is it will be water soluble when it's released, but can we have a channel or even a pump that is gonna be able to move this big, huge, massive structure out of the cell? No, so how do we get big things out of the cell again? Exocytosis. Exactly. So this is going to leave the basal surface via exo cytosis. We bundle it up in a vesicle and spit it out into the interstitial fluid. And where does it go from there? I 
Excellent. All right. In this case, even though it's water soluble, this big, huge bundle of fats is going to enter into the lacteal. But luckily, we know the pathways here as well. Lymph containing this chylomicron leaves the lacteal and enters into what? What did the lacteals feed into? Lymphatic capillary? Well, remember the lacteal is a lymphatic capillary. So what do all the lymphatic capillaries feed into? A lymphatic vessel. Excellent, what kind of lymphatic vessel? A duct? Not the duct yet. Before it feeds into the duct, before it feeds into the trunks, what does it feed into first? There we go. Collecting vessels, right? Both afferent uh, and efferent. And what determines whether they're afferent or efferent? Whether it's before or after the um, lymph node. Yeah, exactly. So it's feeding into both afferent and efferent collecting vessels uh, that are going into multiple lymph nodes. Excellent. And then you guys are right. From there, it feeds into the intestinal trunk. And what does the intestinal trunk feed into? Before the thoracic duct. Cisterna chili, chilla. Cisterna chili, exactly. The cisterna chili, which where it can be stored, where it can be processed, those fats can be stored and processed in there, and eventually lead into the thoracic duct, which feeds into what? What does the thoracic duct feed into? Excellent, into the left subclavian vein, which feeds into for the spear vena cava. You're close, but you skipped one step. The left subclavian from the arm meets with the internal jugular from the head and feeds into something that collects blood from both the arm and the head, or maybe I should say the head and the arm. Brachiocephalic. There we go. However, do we have one brachiocephalic vein or two brachiocephalic veins? Left. There we go, excellent. Then from the left brachiocephalic vein, we feed into the superior vena cava. And from there, we feed into to be easier now. Yeah, or more specifically, our goal, the right atrium. There we go. See, and again, no new information there. We're just using the information we were supposed to have already learned and retained from previous sections to trace our chylomicron basically to the heart where it could then be sent anywhere. And there you go. Just that easily, we have answered our third possible essay question. Again, and uh, you'll have to tell me if this has changed as well, because I really like it, but it's got one part that I really don't like. Again, notice here we have that lingual lipase released in the oral cavity, but remember it doesn't become active till the stomach. Small intestine are bile salts and the pancreatic lipase. Some brush border enzymes can help in this. And then we bundle up those fatty acids, those bile salts, the alcohols into micelles. 
which cross the apical surface via simple diffusion. Bile salts are released at that point and are um, fatty acids, our alcohols are converted back into triglycerides, bundled up into chylomicrons with other uh, lipids, coated with proteins, and then that huge bundle has to be released by exocytosis into our lacteal, and then we follow it all the way back to the heart. Now, like I said, I like, again, here which shows the enzymes and stuff, we did all of that. I really like this picture from your textbook, it shows how the fat globule is emulsified by the bile, making it easier to break up with the enzymes. Once broken up with the enzymes, those bile salts, the fatty acids, the alcohols and all of that are bundled together into the cells and they cross the apical border into the cell, reformed into triglycerides, bundled up uh, with other lipids, coated with proteins and leave the basal surface via exocytosis as chylomicrons. I like this picture a lot because I think it does a nice job of simply showing these processes, but I have one big major issue. What's bigger? A micelle or a chylomicron? Chylomicron. Chylomicrons oh. are way, way bigger than micelles are. Now, I know the reason for this is the perspective that they were trying to give us on this, where you're going from, you know, the big fat globule into the things. But I think that that's the one disservice they do with this illustration. Obviously, the chylomicrons are way, way more massive than the micelles. And clearly, this micelle is not to scale for the uh, absorptive cell. And so I think that's where they kind of, our artists got a little lost on this process. But otherwise, I think it is a nice illustration that does a good job of showing the process if you ignore the size. And there you go. Just that simply, we have gone through our three absorptive pathways, broken down our macromolecules chemically and mechanically into their basic building blocks, crossed them across the apical surface and the basal surface, got in them into our interstitial fluid, and sent them to our heart for circulation throughout the body. And like I said, I guarantee you one of those three assorptive pathways is going to be an essay question on your exam. All right, and which one you get will be completely random. All righty, questions on that? Are All you right. going to post the, um, the pages that you did on Canvas in one of the modules of the breakdowns of each? Uh, I didn't actually save them uh, just simply because they're mostly words. Right, I, I, I save the illustrations when I do illustrations, but really these are just words. So I didn't, uh, honestly, I didn't, I, I would have if I had thought about it, I guess, but normally when it's no just- No worries, words, I can it, just go back in the lecture once you post it in screenshot or something to study. Yeah. Sorry. And again, no, hopefully okay. you were writing these down as well. I just, I didn't think about it because it's usually more when we're doing the elaborate drawings that I think of this. This was more just, really yeah. this was just organization of, of thoughts. So that was really all I was looking for here. And again, the only other thing is you are welcome to do it this way, but this is not required. I'm not saying this is how you have to organize the information. So if instead you want to talk about all the things that happen in the mouth, both chemically and mechanically, then all the things that happen in the stomach chemically and mechanically, and all the things that happen in the small intestine chemically and mechanically, Again, this is not the required way that you have to present this information. This is just how organizing it works for me. So whatever works for you is totally acceptable and totally fine. I just want the material. I don't care how it's presented, okay? So, yep, so just please make sure you do that. So I apologize for that, but yeah, no, this is just, I think of this more as a table that I'm using to organize my thoughts. All right, uh, so like I said, Excellent, that is, uh, again, that information. Uh, let's go ahead and take our break now, uh, get our caffeine, and uh, most of the heavy lifting is done at this point, so that's a nice thing, so we should be finishing soon. Uh, let's take a 15 minute break, looks like it's 9.40, so that means uh, we will restart at uh, 9.55, and I will start the recording, since, especially since I forgot to start at the beginning today. I will set that there as well.
All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Excellent. So we left off and we had talked about our three main absorptive pathways, one of which I guarantee is going to be on the exam. But there's other one final fourth important absorptive pathway that we haven't talked about yet. And what is that the absorption of? Nucleic acid. True, we haven't talked about nucleic acids, but their pathways are actually almost identical to carbohydrates. Uh, and so that, and they're only broken down uh, chemically, uh, I mean, mechanic, pardon me, let me try that again, chemically in the small intestine. So it's not as interesting and not as useful. Uh, so that isn't the one we're going to talk about, although that is one. There's one other absorption pathway water. that we talked about. There you go, exactly. And that is the absorption of water, right? Over nine liters of fluid enter our intestinal tract every day. Now that doesn't mean that you're sitting there chugging the Gatorade, right? Because if you remember, only about, actually let's start here. Only about two and a half liters of that actually come from the food and the drink we ingest. If you remember, as we've been going through all the organs of the alimentary canal, we have been identifying all of these secretions like saliva, like our gastric juice, our bile, our pancreatic juice, our intestinal juice, and on and on and on that we have been releasing into the alimentary canal. And if you think about that, if you remember that the lumen of our alimentary canal is outside of our body, then if you think about it, we've got about nine, seven and change liters a fluid that is released from our body every single day. And so not surprisingly, not only do we need to absorb the water from the food and the drink that we ingest, but we also have to absorb the majority of that fluid back into our body as well. Because after all, we don't have eight liters of extra fluid we can afford to lose during the course of the day. Now, one of the things that I think people find surprising is that the vast majority of that water is reabsorbed in the small intestine. If you grab 10 people off the street, I'm guessing that at least half of them will tell you that the primary organ for absorption of water is the large intestine. And that is a bit of a misnomer. And then the reason for that is that uh, the large intestine doesn't do a lot as far as absorption goes. There's very little absorption, not none, but little absorption that takes place. There is little chemical and mechanical breakdown. Ow. That are taking Ow. place here. So of the things that do occur in the small, I mean, in the large intestine, the biggest thing that our large intestine does is absorb water. And again, the other reason why I think it's something that people are aware of is because uh, if it is inappropriate in that water absorption, if for instance, the, the, the feces goes too quickly, through the uh, large intestine without having enough water absorbed, then uh, when we defecate, it is a more watery diarrhea type of uh, expulsion. Whereas if it stays too long in the large intestine, gets too impacted, gets too much water absorbed, we're constipated as a result of it. So we're aware of those imbalances of water reabsorption when they take place in the large intestine. So definitely water absorption in the large intestine is important but it's not the primary location where it takes place. The primary location, like all absorption, primarily takes place in the small intestine. Water absorption primarily occurs via osmosis. And again, when we think of the pathways, it would enter both the lymphatic uh, capillaries, those lacteals, and our blood vessel capillaries. So Again, those would be both pathways that we talked about to get back into the heart and be distributed throughout the body. So again, it's not worth uh, writing out because obviously there's no chemical and mechanical breakdown of it, but it is still an important process that we need to talk about. 
our goal is to absorb most of the water we ingest, most of the water we secrete. And again, uh, it can vary from uh, defecation to defecation, but on average, only about 100 milliliters of water remains in the feces. But as we mentioned, imbalances in that water can dramatically affect the composition of our feces. And that actually brings us to our large intestine. Our large intestine is primarily divided up into three main regions. Those three main regions are the pouch-like cecum, the pouch-like rectum, that are the entry point and the exit point for the large intestine, and the long tube-like structure in between known as the colon. However, these three regions, we can also divide up into eight individual parts. Uh, the colon, as we can see, is divided first into the ascending colon, where it goes up the uh, abdominal pelvic cavity, till this sharp hairpin turn, known as the right hepatic flexure, uh, because it's happening on the right side of the body and it is a flexure, a right, sorry, right colic flexure uh, because it's a turn to the colon on the right side of the body. Or it's also known as the hepatic flexure because this is the part of the large intestine that is in close proximity to the liver. Hepatic refers to liver. We then have our transverse colon that goes across in a transverse section of the abdominal pelvic cavity into the left colic or splenic flexure, another hairpin turn that happens to be located right next to the spleen, hence the term splenic flexure. Our descending colon that goes down and then our S-shaped sigmoid colon. Remember also, as we talked about at the beginning of this, our ascending colon and descending colon are both retroperitoneal, anchored in the posterior part of the abdominal pelvic cavity and surrounded by an adventitia, where, as we also talked about, our transverse colon and our sigmoid colon, both of these regions are intraperitoneal. Uh, they have their own mesenteries that hold them in place. Remember, this is held in place posteriorly by the transverse mesocolon and our sigmoid colon and held in place by the sigmoid mesocolon. So they are surrounded by cirrhosis, they are intraperitoneal and have more flexibility of movement. When we look at the gross anatomy, not only do we have these distinct regions to it, but there are some other large specializations we want to be able to identify as well. The first and hopefully most obvious of these is that our large intestine is segment, segmented into these large pouch-like structures. A singular pouch-like structure would be, oh, that doesn't show up well, would be a hostrum being the singular. And then the plural of it, the multiple of them would be the hostra. These are big pouch-like structures formed primarily by the tension in the longitudinal layers of the muscularis externa. In fact, if you look closely, you will see that there are some enlarged bands of the longitudinal muscle. So here we see on the top, here we see uh, running uh, down the side and through the sigmoid colon, these enlarged bands of the longitudinal muscles that help to keep the tension in the large intestine and give it its pouch-like characteristics. And these enlargements of the longitudinal layer, really bands, uh, thickened enlarged bands of the longitudinal layer are what are known as the tenia coli. Again, fun with vocabulary. Another specialization that we've already talked about in this class is that long worm-like structure that attaches to the cecum. 
known as the vermiform appendix or just the appendix. Remember, it contains uh, lymphatic tissue, uh, colony seeds of the bacterial flora and fauna of our large intestine. So plays an important role in helping to maintain the health of our large intestine and protecting it uh, with that lymphatic tissue. And the other uh, key characteristic that you see a lot of on our large intestine are these clusters of adipose tissue attached to the outer surface. Now, again, we're not talking about the mesenteries. Remember, there is going to be a greater omes uh, omentum that comes off of this and drapes down over the top. We already talked about the transverse mesocolon. We already talked about the sigmoid mesocolon. Uh, and obviously in this space in between would be the mesentery proper that holds the small intestine in place. No, what we're talking about is on the outer surface of our large intestine are these small clusters of adipose tissue, uh, what are known as the epiploic appendages or the fatty appendices as you can see here. Their function is not fully understood. It believes that it may be an energy source readily available for the bacterial flora and fauna, a way of storing excess calories inside of the body. Again, the full function is not appreciated and understood, but it is a consistent structure uh, that we see on the large intestine from a gross anatomy standpoint. When we look at this histologically, we will see much like the small intestine, it does have intestinal crypts and those primarily produce mucin. Right, producing that mucus uh, to help in the compacting, uh, solidifying and, and also greasing the wheels, making it easy for that chyme to be converted into feces and then expulsed from the alimentary canal. I have a histology slide of this here. Ah, perfect, here it is here. Notice a couple things that we can see about this when we look at it histologically. Uh, again, one of the things we're gonna look at right away is count the number of muscle layers. And indeed there are just two. So that tells us right away, we are not in the stomach, which is something that is important as we're looking at that. That brings us to the apical surface as we look at the apical surface. Oh, and just out of curiosity, uh, this layer right here, layer one, what layer of the muscularis is that? The submucosa? Well, no, this is the muscularis, so circular layer, and that makes two here what? longitudinal layer, excellent. The submucosa, as was pointed out, would be this region up here. Right? And notice again, there is our muscularis mucosa, helping us to distinguish our mucosa from our submucosa. Notice this one doesn't have duodenal glands. It doesn't have pyrus patches. Notice there are some really large blood vessels in here. So we do see some really large blood vessels in here, but that isn't necessarily something that is consistent of this. But what we want to do now, now that we know this isn't the stomach, the trick is going to be to distinguish this between the small intestine and the large intestine. And the way you're gonna do that is by looking up here at the mucosa. Notice when we look at the mucosa, we do indeed see these intestinal crypts, these invaginations from the mucosa that are filled with these glands and notice there are a large number of goblet cells in here telling us that clearly we are producing a large amount of mucus in this area. And what do you else notice about the uh, apical surface of our large intestine that differentiates it from our small intestine? Well, true, in the gross anatomy, we'd be able to see hostra. However, in this particular view here, are we seeing hostra? There we go, no villi. Oh. Remember, there's gonna be no villi because again, the small intestine has the villi where that's the most of the absorption takes place. 
whereas our large intestine doesn't have that specialization. Most of the organs of the digestive system look fairly different. The three challenges that I, that, that I find, the ones that I think are most are challenging for me to tell apart is the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. And there's really two places you wanna look to figure that out. The first place you look, the most obvious place you look is the muscularis. If you see three layers, dead giveaway, you're in the stomach. If you see two layers, you're either looking at the small intestine or the large intestine. So then where you look is up here at the top. Villi, small intestine. No villi, large intestine. And for argument's sake. No. If, yes, really. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if we did have villi up here, how, where would we go to look to figure out which region of the small intestine we were in? Submucosa. We would look in our submucosa for either uh, Bruner's glands, duodenal glands, which tells us we're in the duodenum, Pyrus patch that would tell us we were in the ileum or neither, which would tell us we're in the jejunum. So if you go through the histology in that order, you should be able to hopefully easily differentiate the stomach from the small intestine from the large intestine. All right, questions on that? And be able to distinguish the three regions of the small intestine as well. Excellent. All right, that is both the gross anatomy and the microscopic anatomy. So let's talk about some of the activities that are taking place in the large intestine, starting first with our mechanical movements. Of course, like all, we are going to have peristalsis, like we do in all of the organs of the alimentary canal, but it isn't the primary activity that is taking place there. For starters, remember way back, oh, oh, ah, that's what we forgot. Come back here. Like most of the organs that we've looked at so far in the alimentary canal, it is bounded both proximally and distally by valves, right? That are gonna regulate the movement of materials into and out of them. Proximally, that valve is the ileocecal valve, which again, if you think about it, makes sense from a vocabulary standpoint. Uh, ileum is the last part of the small intestine. Cecum is the first part of the large intestine. So there is a large valve-like structure uh, controlling the movement of uh, chyme, still chyme at this point, into the cecum of the large intestine. And of course, distally, even though it's not listed here, we have not one, but actually two valves that control the movement of, uh, at that point, feces out of our alimentary canal. And they are the internal and external anal sphincters. So we have two distal valves and one proximal valve controlling the movement of chyme in and feces out, which of course brings us to our last iteration, our last change. Remember, we started with cheeseburger. From there, we turned it into a bolus. From there, we turned it into chyme. And now finally here in the large intestine, we will convert it into feces. So as I mentioned, three iterations, three changes in our food from cheeseburger to poop. All right, excellent. So when we think of the activities associated with the large intestine, it starts with our gastroileal reflex. Remember, as we talked about when that food reaches the stomach and the stomach stretches, we said that sent a signal to the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal sphincter uh, to open allowing the old chyme out of the small intestine into the large intestine to make room for the new food that's on its way in. 
those individual hostra will contract as well. So again, if you think about it, we have these three pouches right next to each other. These individual pouches will contract. Now notice when the circular muscle around this contracts, it is going to uh, both uh, churn, mix, compact the material uh, that is inside of it, the chyme that is in here. And when this individual hoster contracts, which way does it move the chyme? Just one direction. Direction. Yeah, notice in this case, some of that chyme is going to be moved to this hostra, but some of it's going to be moved posteriorly to the previous hostra as well. Notice in this fashion, its primary function isn't motility, isn't moving, or isn't propulsion, I should say, moving it from one side of the large intestine to the other. This is more similar to segmentation, where it's being used to process the chyme. We're mixing it with the bacteria in this case. We are compacting it. We're extracting water. We're extracting nutrients, right? We're uh, turning it up with those bacteria and shifting it from one location to another. So it is very, very similar to segmentation in that fashion. These occur at a rate of about every 30 minutes. And like I said, their job is to help in the processing of that chyme converting it into feces and helping in that water absorption. But we are going to need to be able to remove that feces. And so for that, we have uh, processes similar to peristalsis known as mass movements. These mass movements are large, powerful waves that move through the large intestine. Uh, Again, it varies depending on the composition of the food, the quality of the food, the number of times you eat, all of those types of things. But in general, on average, these mass movements occur about three or four times today. Uh, they are stimulated by gastrin. So typically, the more you eat, the more gastrin you produce, uh, the more defecation that takes place as a result of that as well, which makes sense. The more food you're ingesting into the system, the more food you need to then move out of the system as well. These powerful contractions occur along the entire length of the uh, small of the large intestine with the goal of moving this uh, material, the chyme converted into feces, into the uh, rectum, a pouch-like structure that will accumulate it for uh, expulsion from the body. And then lastly, there is the gastrocolic reflex. Again, as we talked about, the stomach stretch increases the motility of the large intestine. And again, we kind of talked about these things, right? That little kid sits down at the table, eats the food, uh, takes a couple bites, that opens up the ileocecal valve, more chyme enters into their large intestine, it increases the motility of the colon, the moving more food towards the rectum, and suddenly they have to run up because they have to go poop because right, they have a much shorter, um, you know, large intestine than we do. And so those types of smaller movements can have a greater impact on their, uh, on their defecation process. All right. Those are the motility functions. There are some other functions that are taking place in the large intestine. However, most of it isn't by the large intestine itself. The Professor, large, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, UJ said uh, his computer uh, crashed. He just trying to restart it, he'll be back. Uh, who is he? Uh, UJ, uh, he's a oh, student. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure, yep, yeah, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Of course. Excellent. Uh, so. Um, the large intestine chemically doesn't do a lot. In fact, the only thing that the large int intestine itself produces is mucin. 
It has those intestinal crypts producing that mucin, producing that mucus to, again, basically coat and uh, make the fecal matter more slippery so that it is easier to expulse. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything that goes on in the large intestine. The large intestine itself doesn't do it, but as we've talked about, the large intestine has a massive bacterial flora and fauna. I think we talked about this way back in the, uh, uh, in the lymphatic system when we were talking about the lymphatic system or our immune response really, because as we talked about this bacterial flora and fauna is a major, major region of research where billions of dollars are being spent to study this because we are learning more and more how the composition of which bacteria are present in your large intestine can have huge impacts on many of the functions of your body. Uh, they're finding that uh, things like intolerances to, uh, to, again, we're not talking about Crohn's disease, uh, but intolerances to uh, gluten some autoimmune disorders, uh, some allergies may be related to uh, the bacterial activity that is taking place in your large intestine. And I think we already talked about how uh, that if you happen to have the right composition of bacteria in your feces, researchers will spend very, very much money to get that from you so that they can make poop pills that they can then insert as uh, suppositories into other individuals to repopulate that bacteria. And they're finding some major impacts on that in many, many ways, other than just the digestive system. So again, the implications of it are huge. We'll focus primarily on the digestive functions right now, uh, but it is a, a very interesting field of research that is going on. Now, thanks to that bacteria, uh, there are materials that can be absorbed by the large intestine. Obviously, as we talked about, water is absorbed here. Any bile salts that didn't get absorbed in the small intestine can be absorbed here, but there are other organic materials, and those are the ones that are primarily produced by the bacteria. So bacterial activation inside of our large intestine is going to release some of these materials that were trapped in the undigestible foods so that we are able to absorb them before they come, uh, before they leave our body. Uh, certain examples of these include uh, vitamins, including our um, many of the uh, lipid soluble vitamins. Also, vitamin B12 is released uh, from our food by that bacterial activity. And wasn't there something really important about vitamin B12? Makes red blood cells. Yeah, it's necessary for the production of red blood cells. So wasn't there something produced way back in the stomach that is gonna allow us to absorb this B12 once it's released by the bacterial activity way down here in the small intestine? There you go, intrinsic factor, excellent. You guys jumped ahead of me. Intrinsic factor produced by the parietal cells, absolutely. That it, parietal cells produces that intrinsic factor and allows us to absorb that B12 way down here in the large intestine. Lastly, when we think of functions of the large intestine, its job is to convert that chyme into feces, store that feces until we get to a socially appropriate location, and then remove those fe that feces from our alimentary canal. Before we talk about the defecation process, let's talk a little bit about what the bacteria is doing in here. I know in uh, micro, you'll get much more of this, so I'm going to broad stroke this and I don't care too much about the specifics. As we talked about, uh, the bacteria help to break down uh, digestible food that we are not capable of breaking down ourselves with our own enzymes. So they release many of our lipid soluble vitamins like vitamin K, vitamin B12, vitamin B5, uh, things along those lines. Other electrolytes and other minerals can be released in that way. However, uh, I'm not sure the cost is the right word, but there are some implications to the function of these bacteria. Because as we know, bacteria typically break things down using fermentation, bacterial fermentation, which is a fancy way of saying anaerobically. 
And what does it mean to break things down anaerobically? Without oxygen. Without oxygen, absolutely. Right. And so when you break things down anaerobically, typically they're not broken down completely. As a result of that, undigested carbohydrates are often converted into carbon dioxide and methane gas, which we release from the digestive system as flatus. That flatus, well, mine smells like a rose, but for other people's, it might not necessarily uh, because undigested proteins are often converted into ammonias or indoles, as well as hydrogen sulfide gas, giving that flatus its distinct odor. And as we talked about, that bilirubin, as we mentioned, is broken down into stercobilin, which stays in the digestive system, leading to the coloration of our feces, as well as urobilin, which as we talked about, is reabsorbed into the body and released by the kidneys, leading to that pigmentation of both the urine and our feces. So again, like I said, these are just some examples of what happens during this process of bacterial fermentation. And like I said, I know you'll get into this. You know what? I just read about that. I just heard about that, how UC Davis has developed a, a seaweed supplement. And I was shocked by how much they put into it. It was only like a quarter of a cup or something crazy like that. It was a really small amount of the seaweed supplement that they put into it. And I thought it, it turned down the gas emissions uh, from burping right? Because uh, 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 cows release methane both in their burps and also in their flatus. And it was the burping methane that was reduced by like a third or something crazy like that. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. I didn't read the study, but I heard a discussion of it. And I thought that was really, really interesting. So yeah, again, all those uh, Aggies at Davis uh, have their use on occasion. Excellent, excellent. All right, so like I said, I know you'll get a lot more of this in micro. So again, those are big broad strokes, but uh, you'll get to learn all sorts of fun things about the bacteria in your large intestine in microbiology. All right, again, to beat the dead horse, uh, depends dramatically on the volume of food you ingest, the number of times you ingest it, the composition of the food you ingest, and so on and so forth. But in general, after about 12 to 24 hours, uh, the breakdown and absorption of materials in your large intestine is complete, and that chyme has finally been converted into feces. Feces uh, contains water, making up about two, uh, three quarters of its uh, content. Uh, about 5% of it is either bacteria or the decomposition components uh, from the bacteria breaking things down. Uh, indigestible and inorganic materials. Again, you haven't thought of it probably in these terms, but you're aware of it because right around the corner is summer. And one of the best things to do during the summer is to grill and eat corn on the cob. And how can you help tell when you've eaten corn on the cob? It looks the same when it comes out. It looks the same, but as it turns out, it isn't truly the same. You are right. You can see the kernels of the corn in your feces afterwards. However, it turns out you're not really seeing the kernel. The kernel of the corn is a basically cellulose shell, right? In the same way that our body can't break down grass, which is primarily made of cellulose, it can't, can, it can't break down the shell of the corn kernel as well. However, all the good stuff on the inside does get broken down and absorbed. However, what's left is that cellulose shell, which then is expulsed uh, from in your fecal matter. So yeah, so it's, you're just seeing the shell. It's not the whole kernel, but just that cellulose shell. But yes, yeah, so, yeah, corn is probably the greatest example of something where we see that. And then lastly, don't forget that as we talked about, all of the chemical and mechanical and acid and all those stuff that is going on is very damaging to the epithelial tissues of our alimentary canal. So not surprisingly, you have a fair amount of yourself that leaves in that feces as well, which is why when you leave feces on someone's doorstep, don't use your own, use somebody else's because if they're so inclined, they could check the DNA on it and you know match it to you. 
So again, use your neighbor's poop and not yours. Uh, or just not leave poop on someone's door. I guess you could do that too. All right, questions on that? All right, we have made the feces and we already talked about the pigment. Uh, primary pigment, as we talked about, is the stercobilin. Uh, however, if you read this uh, gulp, one of the things you'll hear about in gulp is a case that occurred many, many years ago uh, where there was uh, a child, several children, but one child in particular in England who was having really dark red poops. And obviously there's the concern of blood, thousands of dollars worth of tests and all these things came in. They were hospitalized, watched for a few days in the hospital and it went away, went home, suddenly it came back again. And after many days and many thousand dollars of research, what they found is this kid was, nope, Beats is a good guess. You're very, very close. It is indeed a red pigment. But in this case, the red pigment was coming from their uh, booberry uh, cereal the red dye in the blueberry cereal is one that uh, used to, now it's no longer like this. So you can eat three bowls of blueberry cereal and not have to worry about this, but the original blueberry cereal, uh, the red dye in it is one that was not, couldn't be broken down by the body. And so the kid was going home and eating three bowls of cereal in the morning. And basically, you know, the pigment was coming out in their uh, fecal matter. So obviously some of the things we eat, beets and other things can affect it as well. Uh, speaking of um, the color of feces. Yes. Uh, so I was a vegetarian for like 21 years. So like my poops were yellow and I thought that was normal. Like until I started eating meat and they it became like brown. The funniest thing. Well, I, I see. Um, I wouldn't say that again. You are right in that the color of the feces can be changed uh, by our diet, absolutely by the diet. So I wouldn't say that having a lighter colored feces was necessarily abnormal, but you're absolutely right. The, the, the composition of your diet does directly affect the, 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 the color of your feces, absolutely. Yeah. All righty. Now we have made our feces. The job is now to expulse it from the body. And the same way that the entry to our alimentary canal was specialized, the exit of our alimentary canal is specialized as well. And here we see the gross anatomy of the exit of our alimentary canal, the rectum and the anus. The rectum is a large pouch-like structure, as we can see here, an extension of our alimentary canal and is primarily lined, again, still with a simple columnar epithelial tissue. However, notice there is a specialization to our rectum, much like the rugae in the stomach, much like the plicae circularis in our a small intestine, we have a fold of the mucosa and submucosa, and there are multiples of them that actually stick out into the rectum, known as the rectal valves. Now, what might the function of these rectal valves be? To close it off. Exactly, right? In the stomach, it allowed for expansion, the rugae. In the small intestine, it allowed for slowing the chyme down and also increasing the surface area. But in this case, these rectal valves help us to essentially uh, allow us to release the flatus without releasing the feces, All right? I think the technical term for that is a shart, right? Uh, where again, the goal is to, again, limit the movement of that feces out until expulsion is actually required. So it does have to help to have as a, as a, as a stopgate, basically, to help to slow the flow in this case. Notice there is a transition as we move from the rectum to the anus. The anus, much like our Oral cavity is exposed to the outside world, you know, has to take the use and abuse. So not surprisingly is lined with that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. 
And kind of like we saw in the esophagus, where the transition was very, very abrupt, notice we kind of have the same thing here as well. There is a pectinate line, and this pectinate line is basically that transition region from the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue of the anus to our simple columnar of the rectum. Notice at that transition point, there are a couple other specializations as well. Notice there are some additional folds in the mucosa, in this case, not involving the submucosa, but of the mucosa. And these uh, enlargements of them are what are known as the anal columns. The goal of these anal columns is to help to facilitate the compacting of the feces for expulsion as it is being released. So from this large pouch-like structure as it is being funneled out, these columns have to help to, uh, to compact the feces for expulsion. Uh, one of the interesting things we see in the submucosa in this area, notice when we look in the submucosa, is that there are these very large loose veins. Now, as we know, veins are important for the collecting of fluid, and in this case, uh, you know, large loose vein sinuses uh, play an important role in uh, making sure there's a freedom of, of movement uh, why these are here, I don't fully appreciate and understand, but it is definitely a specialization of this area. And some of you unfortunately are aware of this because if you happen to have a difficulty with defecation or things along those lines, these blood vessels can become inflamed and enlarge, causing them to become very painful as a result of that. And what do we call that condition? Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids, exactly. Hemorrhoids is an inflammation of the hemorrhoidal veins. Again, I don't fully understand why these hemorrhoidal veins are here, but again, if irritated by defecation, uh, that can cause hemorrhoids to occur as a result of that. And then you get to sit on a donut pillow for I don't know, a couple of weeks or however long it takes for it to resolve. You don't sit on the donut anymore. No, you don't sit on the donut anymore? They don't give those out anymore, no. Oh, well then what do you do? concentrates the pressure, so no. Oh, really? Interesting. All right, well then there you go. All right, excellent. There are two more specializations that I wanna point out to you here. They're ones that we mentioned earlier, but now we get to actually see them. And those are the valves that we talked about. Remember, there's not one, but there are two valves that are found here at the distal end. And here in this illustration, we see them very, very nicely. Notice, kind of like we expect, we have an enlargement of the circular layer. of our circular layer of smooth muscle known as the internal anal sphincter. Being smooth muscle, is this voluntarily or involuntarily controlled? Involuntary. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. However, notice there is also an external anal sphincter. This external anal sphincter is an enlargement of the urogenital diaphragm. And does anybody remember the primary muscle group that forms the urogenital diaphragm? Levator ani? There you go. Levator ani muscle. So there is an enlargement of the levator ani muscle uh, that helps to form this outer valve 
of the, uh, rain, at, of the rectum and anus known as the external anal sphincter. And being an enlargement of the levator and eye muscle, what type of muscle is it? Skeletal. It is skeletal muscle, uh, which means that it is voluntarily controlled. So notice we have two different types of valves made up of two different types of muscle types uh, with two different ways of controlling them. And the control of these uh, two valves is going to be the primary goal of our defecation reflex. All right, questions on this? All right, then let's talk defecation. We did that, we did that, we did all of that. Excellent, and here's the pretty picture from your textbook, but let's go here and draw and talk about it here. So let's draw our basic anatomy. Again, we have this pouch-like, no, rectum that is fed into by the sigmoid colon. Oops, that's not gonna work down a little bit. There we go. So we have our S-shaped sigmoid colon. Oops. That feeds into the rectum. which feeds out into the anus. And again, we have these two layers. We'll do this one in pink. And this one in dark red. And the pink one, of course, is our internal anal sphincter, which we know is smooth muscle and involuntary. And the outer one is the external anal sphincter and the skeletal muscle and it is voluntary. So when we talk about defecation, defecation is obviously a reflex and it is primarily a sacral reflex uh, using the sacral spinal cord in this process. And not surprisingly, like many of our reflexes, there is going to be both a short and a long portion of the reflex. The short, of course, is going to use the enteric plexus, whereas the long, of course, is gonna use the central nervous system. And by that, we mean autonomic. And again, more specifically, parasympathetic. All right, like all reflexes, we need a trigger. In this case, oops. In this case, the trigger is going to be presentation of feces to the rectum. As we talked about, those mass movements that are taking place inside of our large intestine will move feces into the rectum. And of course, as this feces enters into the rectum, this is gonna cause the rectum to stretch.
of course, we have those stretch receptors. Uh, within the wall of our rectum. And they are going to send signals that are gonna trigger both the short reflex and the long reflex. With the short reflex, basically what happens is that signal goes back to the small intestine pardon me, to the large intestine. And so that short reflex causes an increase in motility of the sigmoid colon. And of course that will bring, this is gonna to be too big, I need to start making this smaller. So that's gonna bring more feces to the rectum. The other thing that it is going to do is it causes, let's say it this way, uh, two things, contractions of the rectum and the relaxation of the internal anal sphincter. So basically, as a result of this, the rectum starts to contract, our internal anal sphincter relaxes, and this is where we get that sensation that we need to avoid. Now, when you get that sensation that you need to avoid, do you instantly void your feces right away? No, and the reason for that is the long reflex. What happens with the long reflex is that that signal from the rectum goes to the sacral spinal cord. And again, in a, whoops, I wanted this to be red. Uh, goes to the sacral spinal cord, again, in a parasympathetic reflex. And the job of this parasympathetic reflex is to cause the contraction of the external anal sphincter. So even though the internal anal sphincter relaxes, the external anal sphincter contracts. And if the external anal sphincter contracts, feces cannot be released. So the presentation of feces to the rectum causes the rectum to stretch, stimulates the colon, stimulates the rectum, relaxes the internal anal sphincter, but also causes the external anal sphincter to contract. So you feel the need to void, but you don't void right away. To void, then, what do you have to do? If you want to defecate, what do you need to do? Relax the external anal sphincter. Exactly. Typically, first, that involves getting to a socially appropriate location, but absolutely. Then we have to voluntarily control the external anal sphincter and relax it. When that occurs, both valves are open, the rectum is contracting, and feces exits. All right, and defecation occurs. But here's the problem. What happens if that need to void occurs while you're sitting in the car driving down the highway and you just passed the sign that said the next rest stop is 30 miles away? You have two choices. 
You can pull over to the side of the road and find a bush, or you can keep holding it and keep driving it. And what happens as you keep holding it? The urge subsides. Exactly. If voiding does not occur, what happens is the sensation decreases. We have a fancy word for that. That fancy word is the signal habituates. And it goes away. That causes the internal sphincter to contract again. The rectum starts, uh, stops contracting, and the need to void goes away. Right. However, if you keep waiting, right, the rectum still is filling. And the more it fills, the bigger the signal, the bigger the stretch. So while it may habituate for a little while, as the rectum continues to full and it stretches to the next critical point, it triggers the sensation again. And how does that sensation feel the second time versus the first time? Bigger. Yeah. The need to void increases significantly. And if you continue to try to hold it more and more and more, and that rectum continues to fill more and more and more, can ultimately the pressure and the contractions of the rectum become powerful enough to overcome the external anal sphincter? Yes. Where it can become great enough to basically force the external sphincter open, and then you're defecating whether you wanted to or not. All right, questions on that? Uh, great question. What I would say is that first, not all running causes diarrhea, but what running can do is as you are, again, as we, and this is actually a great feed into what we're gonna be talking about next. Typically when you're doing that type of endurance type of activity and you're moving and bouncing and around a lot, you are agitating your intestinal tract when you're doing that. You're also typically engaging your core while you're doing that, increasing the abdominal pressure. And so it can move, cause food to move into your large intestine more quickly. And the faster it moves into the large intestine, the faster it moves into the rectum and the less time you have to process it. So then that, so th that is why those activities can sometimes cause, uh, uh, it can increase the rate at which those materials enter into the rectum, in which case you haven't absorbed all of the water. And uh, yeah, no, I, again, with the, with distance running, with long distance running, absolutely, it is not common. And that's why it, the, it, the abdominal pressure, the agitation of the, uh, from running causes the movement more quickly into the rectum without absorbing all of the water first. And so, yes, typically you can get more watery or runs or, or diarrhea as a result of, uh, of running. Absolutely. All right. But hopefully nobody's running right now. And the one advantage of being home for these classes is that if you had to defecate, technically someone in the class could be defecating right now for all we know, right? Uh, you have that ability to be able to go when you need that sensation. However, again, when you need to go or if that signal has habituated some, and the strength of the contractions have weakened, and maybe the internal anal sphincter is not quite as open as much as possible. There are things we can do to help to facilitate, assist in defecation. What are some of the activities that we can do to help to assist in the defecation process? For children or for um, young infants, don't they palpate the rectum? True, you can do that, but I was thinking more for adults. 
It's a magnesium. I'm sorry, say again. Isn't it like when you take magnesium, it makes you go to Okay, you, you are correct. There are supplements or suppositories or things like that that can stimulate it and cause it to go out that way. Right. But I was thinking more, you know, on everyday things. Absolutely. One of the things that we can do, one of the goals is to uh, is to increase abdominal pelvic pressure. How do we do that? Say again. You're a little muffled. Add fiber to your diet. Okay, so yes, absolutely. The composition of the food can affect how easy it comes out. But that's what I was thinking of. Push. When you say push, what do you really mean by that? What do you do to help push the feces out? Flex the abdominal muscles. There you go. One of the things we do is flex the abdominal pel the abdominal girdle. Right? By flexing the abdominal girdle, you contract. Uh, the uh, you decrease the volume of the abdominal pelvic cavity and that increases the pressure. So absolutely uh, flexing the abdominal girdle can do that. How else can we increase the abdominal pelvic pressure? Come on, I know you've all done this. Let's go back to what Allison was talking about, the squatty potty. Why does changing the position of your, uh, for defecation, like so for instance, those potties that are on the floor as opposed to the beds or, or have, having a stool present in front of your toilet uh, changes the angle and again can increase abdominal pelvic pressure. What else can you do to increase your abdominal pelvic pressure? Come on, I know all of you have done all these things. If you can't handle talking about defecation, just wait till we get to reproduction. Hold right. your breath, maybe. There you go, that bearing down. There's a fancy term for that bearing down. It's called the Valsalva maneuver. The Valsalva maneuver is basically, as you mentioned, what you do is you put air in your lungs and then when you put air in your lungs, you close your glottis. And then you contract your uh, thoracic cavity. When you contract your thoracic cavity, basically, rather than the air coming out, the air is pushed down on the diaphragm. And as it pushed down on the diaphragm, that decreases the volume of the abdominal pelvic cavity and increases the pressure, right? Plus you get those great faces that go along with it as well. As you're trying to do that bearing down type of activity, absolutely. The other thing that you can do is to, you are correct, the, the bearing down, you can, there, there, are, there are really three things that can happen when you bear down. You're right, you can trigger a vasal vagal reflex where you actually pass out uh, from an inappropriate uh, uh, vagus nerve uh, activation causing a dilation of blood vessels, causing you to lose uh, blood pressure, which can cause you to lose consciousness. Uh, bearing down can actually cause um, uh, uh, bursting of blood vessels, especially like in your sclera of your eye, so you can get uh, uh, blood vessels that uh, rupture as a result of that. And, and again, uh, the numbers of this are not quite clear because a lot of people, I guess, are not necessarily willing to admit to it. But some studies have shown that as many as 15 to 20 percent of uh, hernias occur from bearing down during defecation. Right, special umbilical hernias. So again, I think not a lot of people, everybody wants to be all manly. No, I was trying to, you know, lift the building and that's how I hurt myself. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm glad you finally made it back in. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so actually uh, 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 some, some inguinal uh, hernias uh, can actually cause from, again, that increase in pressure from that Valsalva maneuver of, of increasing the pressure in there. The last thing that can be done goes back to that urogenital diaphragm. We, remember, we talked about the levator ani muscle. That levator ani muscle can be elevated. As you elevate the levator ani muscle, that helps to open up uh, the uh, valves of the anus and allow defecation to take place. So elevating that or the squatty potties we were talking about, those are things that can uh, elevate the levator ani muscle and make it easier for it to come out. Uh, it can, 
Anal fissures can cause from that. We talked about hemorrhoids can cause uh, be caused for that. Things along those lines can be caused by difficulties in defecation, yes, or forced defecations like we're talking about. All right, here we've done it with the words. Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. And again, as we talked about, we have both a local reflex and a long reflex that through the sacral spinal cord that is going to, again, relax the internal anal, contract the external anal, cause contractions of the sigmoid and the contractions of the rectum. And then we voluntarily release it and defecation occurs. There we go, we did that, we did that, we did that. So again, we have that trigger of the feces descending the rectum, causes the walls of the colon and the rectum to contract, relaxes the internal anal sphincter, but it constricts the external anal sphincter till we get to a socially appropriate location and where we voluntarily relax the external anal sphincter and then defecation can occur. Again, as the pressure increases in this uh, feedback process, if it gets above 55 uh, millimeters of mercury, it can overpower the strength of the uh, rectum and uh, the, or the, the strength of that external anal sphincter. And again, we're not born with control of that external anal sphincter, which you're aware of because when people are born, uh, babies are in diapers. Well, we learn that control, gain the strength in that external anal sphincter. Of course, as we age and our muscles weaken, right, our ability to maintain the feces in the rectum when the rectum's pressure increases can lessen as well, which is why grandpa gets to wear diapers as well. All right, it's the circle of life. We start in diapers, we end in diapers. And like we talked about, there are uh, three main ways that we can assist defecation by primarily increasing the abdominal pelvic cavity pressure. Levate, flexing the levator ani muscle, elevating the anal canal, assisting in defecation, tensing the abdominal muscles, and doing the valsalva maneuver, closing the glottis. All right. Questions on that? All right. Your book's got some really nice tables that goes through all the different organs and all the different things that are happening in all the different organs. Uh, so again, make sure you spend time looking at that, familiarizing yourself with the material, and that is everything that is gonna be on this exam. So with that, we are done with all of the material that I wanted to cover, but as I mentioned, I am happy to uh, do a review. Uh, to help you to answer all those questions. What I'm gonna do right now before I forget is I'm going to go and release the exams. So those will be available for you guys to view as well. And then let's come back, uh, take a short break, come back from the break at, uh, let's call it 11.15. And at 11.15, we can have a review. So if there's any questions uh, on this coming exam or the materials on the exam lab or lecture, we can cover that material and make sure you are prepared for Wednesday. All right, any questions on that? All right, we'll take a quick, quick 10 minute break, give you a chance to stretch, go to the bathroom. We've been talking about this, maybe you need to go get something to drink, uh, sneak out of the room if you're so inclined, but we will do a question and answer review at 11.15 for those who are prepared. I will see you in about 12 minutes. All righty. Uh, I am done with all of the new material I need to present to you. So this is your opportunity for you to ask questions uh, to help you be successful in two days. So again, I don't have any information to cover. Uh, my job is to tell you what I think is important every day during lecture. This is your opportunity to ask me what isn't making sense to you so that we can help to make sense of it so that you can be successful on your exam on Wednesday. I will say that um, the uh, lab exams, as I kind of anticipated, were um, all over the place on the second section. Again, uh, it, because of the nature of it, it's all 
chemical. It's all cellular. It, it's not as intuitive and it can be a little bit challenging. And some of you guys really struggled with this. I think this one hopefully will be a little bit more straightforward, but there is a fair amount of histology on it as well. What I was pleased to see was some real improvement on the uh, lecture exams. Uh, you guys are getting better at your essay questions. Uh, there's still lots of room for improvement. So again, uh, I think the kind of things we talked about today are a good example. I want specifics. I want details. Uh, it is very easy to give big, broad stroke uh, explanations of things, but that's not how you're going to maximize your points. You maximize your points by being specific, being descriptive, really explaining things. Right? Don't just tell me that uh, you know an amino acid hormone binds to the receptor, right? And that uh, and that uh, you know activates the G protein, which causes cyclic AMP to be made. That's 100% true, but it is more specific to say that that amino acid hormone that cannot enter the cell binds to a transmembrane receptor on the outer surface of the cell and activates a G protein on the inside of the cell which then once activated migrates across the plasma membrane, not to a protein, but specifically to adenylate cyclase, right? An enzyme that's job is to convert ATP into cyclic AMP, which is the second messenger and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> make sure you are giving me specifics, make sure you are giving me details. That is how you maximize and make sure you read the questions carefully. There are a couple people who did an amazing job of describing uh, synergistic, antagonistic, and uh, permissive, you know, interactions. The problem is the essay question asked for the three ways that hormones are regulated, which is hormonal, humoral, and neural. So again, a lot of times people lose points not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Make sure you read the questions carefully so that you can answer them correctly. All right. So again, with those warnings based off of the, but again, still improvement. I know the, the lab exam was a little rough, but like I said, this typically has the lowest average. So the good news is it does get better from here. And especially this one, it's one organ system. It's very straightforward. So hopefully uh, that will be something that helps. But at this point, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have on the material. Or we can just all go to bed early. Well, I have a thousand questions, so I right, was excellent. Then lead on. Um, in terms of the process of deglutition, yep. what specifics would you like for deglutition? So, all of it. I want all of it. Absolutely. So you've got the right idea. So that is definitely one of the processes and processes are always things that make a good question. So the first thing, and again, when you're trying to think of this is how many stages are there in this process? Three phases. All right. Absolutely. So what are they? Buckle or the bolus. Up. Uh, pharyngeal and esophageal. Excellent. Excellent. So that's a good start. Absolutely. What happens in each of these phases? What happens in the buccal phase? Anyway. Formation of the bolus and it presents it to the oropharynx. Excellent, which is 100% true, but how did you make that bolus? Mastication. Yeah, so mastication is part of it. What else do you do to the food besides mastication? Moisten it. With saliva, absolutely. You mix it with saliva. Uh, you, you break it down mechanically with mastication, right? Producing, producing basically this soft, goopy chunk, you know, uh, mass that is the bolus, absolutely. And then again, using your tongue, using your teeth, using your cheeks to be able to do that. And then as you mentioned, once you've formed that bolus, then uh, you do the voluntary act of presenting it to the posterior part of the oral cavity. Excellent. And what happens when we reach that posterior part of the oral cavity? Uh, 
the soft palate gets hit, which triggers the uvula and the soft palate to close the nasopharynx. Okay, close. So you're right, pushing against the soft palate does, the bolus pushing against the soft palate does push it up to close, absolutely. So coming in contact with the soft palate with the uvula pushes that up and closes it. But it also comes in contact with something else. What does it come in contact with also? The arches? Yeah, the, exactly, the palatine arches, right? And that's what triggers the actual swallowing reflex. Now, one more thing. Why do we wanna close the, why do we wanna use the soft, soft palate to close the nasopharynx? So it doesn't go up in the nose? Yeah, so that the bolus doesn't go up into the nasal cavity, absolutely. So we make sure that it can't go up into the nasal cavity. And then by coming in contact with those arches, it triggers the actual swallow reflex. And what actually happens during that swallow reflex? The epiglottis. Um... It moves up and closes the airway, the lar larynx elevates. There you go, exactly. So you're right, the larynx elevates, right? The larynx goes up, we feel the Adam's apple going up. And that Adam's apple going up causes two important things to occur. One is that it folds that elastic epiglottis over the glottis, closing that opening. So now the food can't go into the nasal cavity, the food can't go into the airway, but we do need a place for the food to go. We want it to go into the esophagus. So how do we make sure that happens? What is the other thing that elevating the larynx does? Opens the upper esophageal sphincter. Exactly. So basically there are three ways out of the oral cavity. You can go into the nose, you can go into the lungs, or you can go into the stomach. And what we've effectively done here is closed off two of those pathways and opened the third. So basically the only place for the food to go is into the esophagus. So and so the epiglottis cover the trachea? I wrote esophagus, that doesn't seem right. No, it, it covers the larynx. So here, let's cheat and go back to the lecture real quick. Um, <laughs> And let's just use the chart because I think this does the best job of showing it. So when the larynx, which is basically this structure right here, this is what elevates, right? That laryngeal prominence, that's the Adam's apple that we feel in the front, the bump you feel in the front. When that goes up, what happens is the epiglottis closes over the top of the larynx. And the opening in the larynx that air goes through, causing the vibration, causing our speech and all that, that hole is basically called the glottis. So epiglottis is on top of the glottis and when it folds down, it closes off the glottis. So it closes off the airway, closes off the larynx, closes off the trachea, but it does not close off the esophagus. We want the esophagus open. And that's the other thing that happens when we elevate the larynx. When we elevate the larynx, that upper esophageal sphincter opens and that muscular tube that is the esophagus is open so that food can continue on its way into the esophagus. Of course, once it gets in the esophagus, we're in the esophageal phase. And what happens in the esophageal phase? Peristalsis to move it down until the lower esophageal sphincter opens. Perfect. Excellent. As we talked about, anywhere from what, one to 10 seconds for the food to reach the stomach. But what else needs to happen? When you swallow, the larynx goes up and does it stay up forever? The upper sphincter needs to close too. Right. And the way that happens is again, the larynx, the movement of the larynx changes the shapes, changes the functions, causes the things to occur. When it went up, the glottis went down and the esophagus opened. So when it, I mean, when it went up, it, that happened. 
So when it goes down, the epiglottis opens back up, the upper esophageal sphincter closes, with the food gone, our soft palate goes back down and notice now our airway is open again. So we can't breathe while we're swallowing, but the rest of the time we wanna be able to breathe. So our kind of default setting here is to have the airway open, but when we have to move food or drink through there, then our swallowing allows the closing of the airway, the opening of the foodway, and stopping it from going up into the nasal cavity as well. All right, excellent. Did that answer your question? Yep. Excellent. Who else has got one? Well, if you have more, Allison, you're welcome to ask them. Liver anatomy. Yes. In terms of histology, gross anatomy, what are the most important parts? All of it. So again, it's all equally important. Like I'm sorry? I don't like that answer. Well, but it, there is some truth to it. If you think about it, well, the, okay, so the easy answer, of course, is if you want to know what, what you're responsible for for an anatomy standpoint, look at the handout. Right. So if you look at the digestive system handout, it tells you everything you are responsible for for the liver. However, if you think about the liver, the liver is definitely one of those organs that we talked about both its gross and microscopic anatomy. So again, if you think about it, and again, there shouldn't be any surprises on this because it's all on your anatomy list. Uh, that's not what I want. Why didn't that happen? Let's try this again. There. There we go. Obviously, whether it's on a model or whether it's on a chart, you should be able to identify all the gross anatomy structures. That includes the four lobes and that includes the two ligaments, the falciform ligament and the round ligament, right? Uh, also, and again, this isn't the best view of it, but obviously not only the gallbladder, but all of the ducts associated with it. So the cystic duct coming up here, but also the right and left hepatic ducts coming into uh, the uh, common hepatic duct feeding into the bile duct or common bile duct and the cystic. So all of that anatomy is something uh, you should know. It doesn't hurt to know its relationship with the inferior vena cava, how it has that notch in it that is gonna support it and put it in place. Uh, because again, that'll help you to orient yourself with it when you are looking at something like a model uh, that we have on the, on the, on the, um, on the lab or something along those lines. So those are all good resources for those. So all of that was good, important stuff to be able to understand all the gross anatomy of that. However, we also spent a large amount of time talking about the microscopic anatomy. And remember there is that model on the, uh, in, in, in the classroom that is on the Canvas site, which is basically, right, a segment like this. Actually, I guess technically it goes the other way, but it doesn't really matter. You've got all of the triad on one side, the hepatocytes in between, and the central vein in the other. So we were able to look at this microscopically, both on illustrations, both on models, and uh, you need to be able to recognize these things histologically as well, right? We think we did that. Where, again, uh, low magnification, we were able to see the... Uh, lobules of the liver with their central canals, with their lines of hepatocytes, right? The sinusoid capillaries, the spaces in between. But remember also, uh, we were able to look at the portal triad. And not only do you need to be able to recognize them on a model or a chart, not only do you need to know what they do, but they can easily be distinguished histologically as well. And so I guarantee there will be histology slides of the hepatic portal system that, I mean, of the, the portal triad that you'll need to be able to recognize, know what they are, know what they do. And 
let's hear, let's remind ourselves. What's number one again? The vein. Okay, you need to get partial credit if you wrote vein on the exam, but what would you want to write on the exam? Central vein? No, not, the, not of the triad, the portal triad. What vein was it in the portal triad? Hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein, a branch of the hepatic portal vein. And what does it do? What's its job? Move nutrient rich blood. Or bring nutrient rich blood to the liver lobule. Absolutely. What's number two? Hepatic artery. And what is it doing? Brings oxygen rich blood. Exactly, it brings oxygen rich blood to the liver lobule so that those hepatocytes can do their work of processing the nutrient rich blood from the hepatic portal vein. And then, of course, what is three? Bile duct. Bile duct. And what's it doing? One bile out. Yeah, exactly. One brings blood to the lobule, two brings blood to the lobule, three brings bile away from the lobule. There you go. So know the structures, recognize the structures histologically or in models, and know what they do. All right. Great question. So any questions more on the liver before we switch gears? All right, excellent. No, and I appreciate how that can be a little bit confusing. You have the right idea. Uh, the third phase of gastric activity occurs when food, chyme in this case, reaches the small intestine. However, when we're talking about gastric activity, all we care about is how that food that's reaching the small intestine affects the stomach, right? So when we're talking about gastric activity, regulation of gastric activity, all we care about is how uh, food hitting the, chyme hitting the small intestine is affecting the activity of the stomach, all right? So again, regulation of gastric activity, that's all we care about. But you're absolutely correct. When food hits the small intestine, we don't need to just regulate the stomach. We need to regulate the small intestine as well. And in fact, when we see food, think about food, right? It's going to affect the small intestine. When food hits the stomach, it's going to affect the small intestine. When food reaches the small intestine, it's going to affect the small intestine. So yes, many of the same things that control the stomach also influence the small intestine as well. But when we're talking about gastric activity, regulating gastric activity, our focus is the stomach. When we're talking about regulation of the small intestine activity, then we're gonna focus just on the small intestine. So really it's, 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 you're right in that all of these processes are related. After all, when your stomach gurgles, your mouth salivates as well. When the kid takes a bite of food, he has to go poop. So obviously there is a lot of interrelatedness to this. But again, from a testing standpoint, you want to focus on just the things we're talking about. If we're talking about how we control the small intestine, then just focus on how we're affecting the small intestine. When we're talking about regulating gastric activity, and again, remember, that's probably one of the biggest physiological processes we talked about. So I would be shocked if there weren't a handful of questions about that on the exam. Uh, but we want to focus on just how we're controlling the stomach. But you're right, many of the same stimuli that influence the stomach influence the small intestine as well. But technically those would be two different regulatory processes. All right, what's next? Is that it? Everybody's brain's full? During a uh, lecture, we kind of skip over all the teeth and everything. Um, 
all those slides are we we're still responsible for all the information on those slides correct absolutely i was worried we weren't going to have enough time to cover it i want because i wasn't sure how long the physiology was going to take but absolutely and again it's on your study guide for the lab stuff as well you are absolutely responsible for the anatomy and um uh, of the of the teeth the, 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 the basic anatomy of the teeth, the type of joint it forms, both functional, structural, and the specific type of joint it forms, the classifications of the different teeth, uh, the number of teeth that you have deciduous, your first, your primary teeth, and then your secondary or permanent teeth. Uh, yes, that is all stuff you're absolutely responsible for. We just, at the time, I, I, I didn't want to take the time for the anatomy of that just because we had so much physiology and I was worried about time. We finished early enough where we probably could have gone over it based on this, but uh, but absolutely. that. So yes, that was one of the things that I tried to emphasize that absolutely you need to know that stuff. I just didn't want to take the time in class to go over the anatomy of it. Because again, it's more important that we spend the time on the physiology. At this point in your academic careers, uh, as you know, halfway through 431, you guys should know how to handle the anatomy, especially basic anatomy like that. I appreciate histology is a little more challenging. And so I do like to spend more time on that. But basic anatomy uh, should be the kind of thing that you should be able to do independently. So I'm, I don't feel bad about not covering that. But yeah, so it was, a, it was concerned about time. As I mentioned, different semesters, some semesters we have four days to work process this information and some like this semester we have three. It all depends on how the holidays fall out. So when we have four days, I have more time to, for us to go over that in class. And especially in the classroom, we're also doing more physiology in there. You're doing wet labs and things along those lines. So with us having three, I was concerned we wouldn't have time. So that was why I put that on the onus of that on you. Anything else? Yes. Okay. With gastric regulation, mm -hmm. I have local effects and long effects like noted in a lot of places. What is local and what is long? So remember when we're talking about local or or intrinsic versus the long or the extrinsic, uh, we are talking about the type of reflexes. And really the key to those reflexes is, and remember this is a good thing to remember. The big difference in our digestive system between the short or local or an extrinsic, or pardon me, intrinsic. Uh, remember the key to these are, uh, again, we think of it in terms of where the stimulus is. For our shorter local reflexes, the stimulus is uh, in the alimentary canal. Right, so if it's in the stomach, it's, you know, it's having a local effect in the stomach. If it's in the mouth, it's having a local effect on the mouth. If it's in the small intestine, it's having a local effect on the small intestine. So with that stimulus, it is in the organ of the alimentary canal. Of course, our second thing when we think of our reflexes is where the command center is, where the decision is being made. And remember with our short local intrinsic, that is occurring there in the organ, in the enteric plexus. So again, that gut brain that we talked about is making the decision. And then of course, the third thing we care about with a reflex is where the effect is. And the effect and the affected organ in this case is going to be the same organ uh, that was stimulated. So again, it has a local effect. If the stomach stretches, the stomach processes that within its enteric plexus and the stomach contracts more. That's an example of a local reflex. The, the stimulus is occurring inside of the organ. It is being processed by that gut brain and it is affecting the same organ that was stimulated. All right. With our long reflexes or our uh, extrinsic, in this case, the main difference, well, there are three, obviously three main differences that we see here, but one of the biggest is in that command center. In this case, our signal travels through the central nervous system. And comes out the central nervous system 
via the autonomic. Now, another big difference when we're dealing with this longer intrinsic is the location of the stimulus. It can actually be in the alimentary canal or outside it. So not only can it be the stretch of the stomach that causes this or the taste of the food, but it could be the smell of the food or the seeing of the food or the hearing of the food or the thinking about the food. So in this case, it doesn't have to actually be in the alimentary canal. The stimulus can come in any of those sensory neurons into our central nervous system. And then that signal then travels out the autonomic nervous system, if it's excitatory via the parasympathetic, if it's inhibitory via the sympathetic, but it can travel out. And the third big difference between these two reflexes is typically with the wrong, long reflexes, we typically affect more than one organ. So seeing or thinking or smelling the food can increase our saliva activity, right? Can uh, cause motility changes in our stomach, can open uh, the ileocecal valve, can, right, can cause all these other effects to occur as well. So if you remember on the very first day when we talked about digestion, we talked about how we controlled the digestive system. One control was neural, and that's what we just did here. There are basically two types of neural controls. And then of course, the other type of control is hormonal. So hormonal is obviously the hormones, but when we talk about the neural controls, one of the key things about the digestive system is it has that elaborate enteric plexus. And because it has that big elaborate enteric plexus, which someone reminds me again, has two branches. What are the two branches of the enteric plexus? I guess I'm glad I asked this question. Parasympathetic cranial nerve ten vagus. So you are right, this, the sympathetic and parasympathetic can affect it by the cranial nerves, by the sympathetic nerves, uh, or the splanchnic nerves. But in this case, we're talking about that elaborate network of nerves associated with, this, the, with the anatomy of the alimentary canal. So when we talked about the anatomy of the alimentary canal, remember we saw where the two branches of the enteric plexus were located, and that helped us to understand what they did. What were the two branches of the enteric plexus? Submucosal and then the mesenteric. Submucosal, oops. And the myenteric, right? Yep. What did the submucosal branch of the enteric plexus do? Control glands. Exactly, it controls the glands. And the myenteric controls what? Smooth muscle. Excellent. Perfect. So because our stomach, well, we talk about stomach because we're talking about uh, gastric regulation, but basically our digestive system, our alimentary canal has this big elaborate enteric plexus this big, huge, elaborate network of nerves, it can actually make some of the processes, make some of the decisions. Normally, when we think of reflexes, we think of reflexes being processed in our central nervous system, in our brain and in our spinal cord, right? That's where we usually think of the processing for reflexes taking place. I touch something hot, the signal comes into my spinal cord, my spinal cord makes a decision, sends it out to my hand, and I pull my hand away before even, I'm even consciously aware of the fact that I should be cursing, right? Well, here, that decision is actually made right there in the stomach by that enteric plexus. And so that's why those short local or intrinsic reflexes are so important because many of the basic decisions that need to be made. And again, 
it's not deciding what you want to do when you grow up or whether you should fall in love or not, right? It's making the kind of decisions, stomach stretch, stomach churn, right? I mean, they're pretty basic reflexes, but they're vitally important for the control of our digestive system. And the hormonal regulation, is that gastrin? Gastrin is one of the many hormones, but remember we also talked about cholecystokinin, we talked about secretin, we talked about gastric inhibitory peptidase, we've mentioned lots of hormones. And so for all those hormones, you should know, and again, your textbook lists even more, but for the hormones I listed, you should definitely know where they're produced, uh, you should know the trigger for their production, what the stimulus for their production is. And just like when we talked about hormones before in this class, you should know the target and the effect, or targets, plural, because many of them do have multiple targets, and the effects of those hormones. So yeah, so there's uh, what, like a half dozen different hormones or something like that I listed. Like I said, your textbook lists even more, but as long as you focus on the ones that I've identified and listed for you, know where they're produced, know what the stimulus for them is, know their targets and effects, you should be fine. Great question. So absolutely, for any gland, and the salivary glands definitely fall in this category. There are several questions we could ask. Obviously, you need to identify the gland. You need to know the functional classification. You need to know the structural classification. And you need to know the substance it produces. Now, the good news is when we're talking about salivary glands, one of these questions, the answer is gonna be the same for all of them. What's the one question that all salivary glands have the same answer for? Merocrine. So which would those four things be? Identify, functional, structural, or substance? Functional. Yeah, functional classification. They all use the merocrine mode of secretion, which means that it is going to be uh, exocytosis, right? One other thing is structurally, they are all compound glands, but not all the same type, right? Our uh, parotid gland, Structurally is compound what? Anyone remember? Alveolar. Compound alveolar, excellent. Only containing alveoli, which tells us it only produces what? Ser uh, serous fluid. Serous fluid, absolutely, right? And so notice when we see a gland that just has serous acini and is a compound acinar gland, we know it must be the parotid. Conversely, if we have a sublingual gland, right, what would its structural classification be? Compound tubular. Compound tubular. And what's the substance it produces? Mucin. Mucin, absolutely. Excellent. So again, if we see a gland that is just um, mucus tubules and ducts, we know it must be the sublingual. Whereas if we saw the submandibular gland, what would its structural classification be? Compound tubulo alveolar. Because it has both serous alveoli and mucus tubules, which tells you what is the substance it produces? Mucus. True, uh, that's not yeah. a bad way. It produces the mucin and it produces the serous fluid, right? So it produces both of those two things together, absolutely. And so again, if we see a gland that has both mucus tubules and serous acini together, we know it must be the sub, uh, submaxillary gland. All right, 
So yeah, so absolutely. So those are things that you need to know for these glands and be able to recognize histologically. And like I said, the good news is you want to see functional classification because if you see functional classification, you don't even have to figure out what gland it is because you know the answer is always going to be the same. The key to all the other pieces of information here is to look at the secretary structures. Right? Because either it's going to be all tubules or more specifically all mucus tubules. It's going to be all serous sinai, or it's going to be a mix of both. And once you figure that out, you know all the answers to all the rest of the questions. All right. What else you got for me? Any more? Not everybody's brain's really full. Half the class is peeled off, so they've already gotten exhausted and left. All right, everybody else is really, really full as well. Okay, well, I will remind you that uh, after, you know, you get about a half an hour, I will have my normal office hours from 1230 to 130. So I will be available for that. If you have any questions, uh, either about the previous exam, which is now available that you can look at and ask that or anything else comes up on the next exam, uh, feel free to come to my office hours or uh, email me. And, uh, and again, I have office hours uh, tomorrow uh, from 11 to 12 as well but I can also respond to email. Uh, so otherwise, uh, good luck on the exam. Uh, hopefully I will not hear from you on exam day. Hopefully, knock on wood, everything will go smoothly on that and then enjoy, have a safe, uh, uh, safe and smart spring break. Uh, study hard on the respiratory and urinary system and I will see you guys when we come back. All right, take care. Good luck. Have fun. <laughs>